Okay. All right. So since it seems like we're going to have your questions not be delivered via audio, um, feel free to post whatever you questions you, you can. I think what we'll do is we'll let's go ahead and, and try to follow the structure that I'm assuming here of using the HackMD. So I will pull I'll put the HackMD up on my web browser over here. Um, and the intention is that uh, people who join can can enqueue the enqueue themselves in this thing. And otherwise, in the absence of any concrete questions, I will just go ahead and see if I can hack on the compiler for a while until questions come in. Um, so, yeah, in the absence of any any concrete questions from you, Matt, which I know you had a blog post that I've not read yet about your experiences trying to hack on the compiler. Um, but let me let me go ahead and I'll, uh, it, yeah, you can. Okay, well, let's talk about, if you got questions about the bug optimization, op optimization patterns, you mean that blog post, that, that, that like massive blog post they did age, ages ago? Someone released a tool recently that automates bug minimization for Rust. And I don't know whether they adopted any of the strategies that I posted there, but that might be worth looking at at some point. Um, but let's talk concretely. What are the, so, okay, bug, let's add a topic to this then, bug minimization patterns. Um, so what's your question, Matt? Go ahead and type it in the HackMD. Oh, of course. Oh, uh, you see, this is this is where I get to find out that I'm uh, not quite doing this the right way. Um, all right, let's give everyone access to read and write. Um, oops, I didn't really mean to publish it. I want to publish it. Uh, no, never mind. We'll keep it published. It's fine. Um, so you should have permissions now. Yeah, I gotta figure out. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna move the 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 zoom the um the zoom window over here so that people can see what you're responding with in the chat for Zoom, because otherwise this conversation's gonna look really weird on the cat in the feed. Um Yeah, yeah, there are definitely some changes that have happened since my blog post. Um everybody loops was removed from the compiler entirely. Um so that means that pattern that particular pattern there was a used to be a z flag called everybody loops and the uh so i'll write this down um in response here um and the effect of that um so the purpose of everybody loops when i first added it was to have a simple way to uh, uh, at a large scale, re just blanket replace all the concrete bodies of every function with a new body that was highly likely or perhaps even guaranteed to be accepted by the compiler. Um, because, and in particular, the insight I had was that both was highly likely to be accepted by the compiler and um, was simple uh, structurally in terms of something that would be very efficient to process, would have very little code generated. And I just I realized that the loop form, um, so it replaced every function body with loop, and this is something that in the language um, is is considered to be a member of every possible type. It, it, it's something that that expression that a loop. This is not a statement; it's actually an expression that returns a conceptually returns a value. It clearly doesn't ever return a value. It diverges, and thus uh, it is actually. Um, so it has type, conceptually, you could think of it as having type exclamation point. I don't know if it's formally represented that way in the system compiler anymore, or ever was in the compiler. It might be, might not be, I can't remember. But that's the idea. And then, and then, and is conceptually a subtype of every other type. Um, but I don't know if that's even, again, I also don't know if that's part of the, I, I used, I had a presentation a while ago about subtyping in Rust, and the only subtyping the language has occurs from lifetimes um, and references um, having a subtype relationship based on whether lifetime relationships are. So what I'm saying exclamation point is a subtype of every type, other type. 
um, at least informally. Um, I don't know if it's represented that way in the compiler today. Um, at, at certainly at one point. Well, anyway, the point is the, the idea was that this gave a way to just blanket replace every function body and still have something that would conceptually would compile um, with the goal being essentially if you wanted to narrow down a compiler bug, you could do this by first replacing all the bodies with this and see if the code still compiled or didn't see if the bug still occurred or not. And if it didn't occur, then you know, okay, this has something to do with some function body is, is causing the compiler bug to surface. And thus you could start hunting for it, perhaps by bisecting over the space of bodies. Um, or you would um, see the compiler bug still occur. And you've now you've learned something also useful in that you know it's not due to a function body. And now you have something that's much simpler to process as in um, a collection of function signatures that interact in some certain way and, and structure definitions and trait definitions and trait implementations. Um, and that's causing the compiler, compiler bug, but the function bodies aren't there. And that means that the compiler, you can invoke it on this much smaller um, structured thing that you can then further minimize from that point on, which I sort of spell out in the blog post. And basically the problem with this is that um, this flag was removed because there were very few people using it for anything. And the main client was Rustock, which was using it for a totally different purpose that was bogus. And so, and the other problem was that it ended up after I added this flag, later we added const function support. And at that time, const functions um, didn't support loops. And so you couldn't actually plug in loop into those bodies. And so it deliberately stopped plugging in loop into every body at that point. And thus the perp sort of the whole purpose of this thing was subverted because you couldn't get that benefit anymore of replacing every body. And it, it just was, you know, old code that people didn't want. The irony here is I think today the const functions can support loops. And so I, you know, one could just put this back in, but I think that the reality is that given the, the reaction people had to it, the better approach here that I would support is to say, we have a separate debugging tool, a separate bug minimization tool that will do this kind of transformation for you and not build it into the compiler anymore. Um, so I, my personal bet here would be to go find uh, whatever that there is a, let me see if I can find it somewhere. Um, Rust bug minimization tool. I can't remember who made it. Um, so I don't see it here, um, but I, maybe it was on Zulip that somebody announced it. Let me try to check there too. Cause someone definitely announced that. I don't know if it was in, it might've been in Reddit. Uh, let me try that too. Uh, but that's the idea. Yeah, that, that would be where I would invest effort right now is to see about, um, to see where, um, the current, uh, state of the art is with respect to, that would help if I spelled it right. Um, state of the art is, no, I can't find it. So I'll have to find it later and, and maybe post it somewhere else, but that's, that's the place I would look. Um, is to see uh, what's been announced in this space and try to add on to that. There's uh, there's pre-existing work. Uh, John, there's a very pretty. I mean, I think like my blog post pointed it out that there's some people who pointed at um, a certain tool uh, that John Regier created um, for minimizing C reduce. Yeah, um, and and people have you see reduce on rust it's because it's it's pretty one because rust syntax is sort of c like and also because the structure of c reduce i think is sort of uh generalized over the patterns it matches and the rewrites it does but it's not ideal it's not i wouldn't try to directly do this in c reduce I, i'd want to see a rust specific bug reduction tool developed um, are there other, the other question is, are there other, you know, examples of things that have changed the compiler besides the, the, the removal of, um, of, uh, everybody loops, which is, you know, my personal uh, favorite. I, I don't know. I think that a lot of this stuff still works. Like this whole thing, the way of commenting code out by adding config, um, statements is still a valid, uh, you know, little hack, pretty printing the most of the pretty printers are still there and can be used except for everybody loops by saying the module tree still works. So yeah, I think a lot of these ideas still apply 
um, you know, many of them are not Rust specific at all. Um, and it's more just a sort of idea of how to do these things. So I, I think that mostly the ideas here do apply. And the interesting question is how to mechanize this. Is Rust reduced the thing? I think Rust reduce is old, relatively speaking. This code, I'm pretty, yeah, see, this hasn't been updated since 2019. Um, so this is not the thing I was thinking of. There is a more recent tool um, that maybe Joshua Yutz had created. I, 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 let me see. Um, or well, Joshua Yutz, let's see if they have any mention of it in Missoula. Uh, unfortunately, I'm again, not going to see it there, I don't think. Yeah, I'm going to waste a lot of time searching for this right now if we do it that. So I, I don't know, uh, but we can keep, well, I might as well keep looking. I, I had some idea of where I'd seen it. Where would it be if not within the Reddit, though? The Reddit was, I thought, like, sort of the best place to look. Um, instead of minimize, maybe I should look for reduce. Um... That's the part of the problem is there's not a standard acronym, acronym or, you know, I, I think MCPE is the most, is the most common acronym for here. Um, so maybe that's the thing to look for. No, I don't think so. Um, if it's not on our Rust on Reddit, um, that's a real shame because um, you would think that it would be the ideal place to be advertising this. And I, I'm trying to remember, trying to think of where else I might've heard about this. Maybe on Mastodon? I think it was you who asked me if I was on Mastodon yet. And then shortly thereafter, I, re I resigned from uh, from Twitter. Um, no, I'm not seeing this. Um, yeah, I'll have to, to follow up later, I guess, because I'm not seeing this right now. And now I can't see anything because I uh, I've covered up my windows. All right, yeah, maybe the right one up. That sounds great. Hey, I was asking people. I was I was hoping someone would jump on the this task last year. Um, I was trying to push hard to get somebody to do it when I was posting the compiler. Um, we had a whole whole thing where we were trying to encourage people to. Um, we wanted to document what the compiler team was doing, and we had a uh, a list of the aspirations for the year and. Um, or ambitions for the year, rather, and one of them was indeed um, a minimization tool. This was here, but we didn't get anyone to jump onto it um, at that time. But I would, I, it doesn't change the fact that we des desperately need work here, and I think there could be huge benefits um, to it. So, if you want to jump on that, I think that would be amazing. And the only question is finding, I like I said, finding the other work that's been done recently in this space. So, all right, in the absence of any other questions, um, maybe I'll spend some time right now just trying to, I was, uh, my plan for a backup plan for today, if there were no topics, um, was to go ahead and see about trying to hack on the compiler for a bit to add the, um, to change it so that we got a better dump for fear uh, in terms of the, the, the whole thing where in my video, I discovered on the fly that if you had a borrow check error, you wouldn't get a fear dump. It's even worse than that. In fact, I didn't realize this. I don't think I fully um, explored this at the time, um, but why is this not responding? That's not good. Did I lose my uh, connection over there? why I always use a screen. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I don't think I talked enough, talked very much about this in the uh, video, but I discovered recently when I was looking more into this problem that uh, you can do unpretty here and that works. But if you go to, un and you can do un here identified and that works. Oh, wait a minute. First of all, this is code that, no, this is, yeah, this, this code, this is some code that's a, it's a, revision of the uh, of that code that I made to uh, 
uh, in a demo uh, of uh, demoing the two phase borrow stuff and how there's a sugared form up here, the desugared form up here, where the, the whole point is that this code isn't compiling today and um, and this desugared, supposedly desugared form does compile. And I was trying to explore the relationship between this sort of this this line versus this line. Right, that was the whole context of the video. And as part of that, I was hoping that um, we would learn something by doing on pretty here or on pretty fear. And in the course of exploring that, I discovered that I learned that a pretty fear tree doesn't work because if you look at the variations that we can make here, it's um, all of these possible things from normal through near CFG. And one of them is theater tree. There's no theater, but there's theater tree, but that doesn't work because when you have an error, the error flag is flag first. But in fact, it's even worse than that in that he, even doing here tight doesn't work either. And so I think a good exploration here would be to, to sit and figure out, okay, uh, what is happening such that the, um, uh, that, that, that we're not getting a, a dump here. So my plan is to uh, just look quickly at what is happening in the control flow here. And I'm gonna see if I can do it with RR because um, Pronosco has been a little flaky with me this morning. Um, and so I'm gonna see if we can just use um, RR, which may not work, but I wanna try. Oh, you know what? Actually, let's let's do it this way. I, I made a special wrapper script. That's um, Rust RR, I think it's called. Yeah. Okay. And it just does the latest thing. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, just a replay dash a replay. So right now, if I hit continue here, um, this will do the replay of the full trace locally and we get and this is using the dash m the dash capital m flag to rr so there's actually event counts being emitted um it's telling what the rr internal event counter is for each line that's being spit out which means you can do this you can say continue and speed it in a certain event count and it'll stop right there so if we want to stop right when the error is emitted we could stop at event number 766 um and you can say, oh, the way you can do this is by saying run run the program and give it 766 as an argument. And what it'll do is it'll run until it hits that event count, and then it'll stop the program. And we can thus do a backtrace right here. Um, now, unfortunately, for some reason, my, um, I'm pretty sure my Emacs is not being as smart as I was hoping in terms of not taking me to the line numbers that I would like to go to. You have to go? Are you, saying, are you waving by? Are you, you got a chat? Oh, I, there's someone asking to come in. I need to look at chat. Hold on. Let me see what you're saying to me. Can I share my screen? You know, that would have been good. Um, yeah, let me do that. Uh, yeah, I forgot, I'm, I'm doing a video capture, but um, so the, the YouTube video will have it, but um, that doesn't help you. Okay, so you see this now. All right, so let me go back to what I was to explain what I was doing. So I started by doing a build and then I did a run of it doing a, on pretty, I was demonstrating that we do on pretty here, we get a dump of that. But if you go to on here type, you get a compiler error. And so I wanted to say, okay, let's debug what's happening here. I did, I grabbed an RR trace and then I'm running a little basic. Yeah, I'm debating about what the best way to do this is, but I'm gonna go ahead and still continue on with this. My integration is not perfect um, with Emacs and GUD. In particular, I in the past I'd had it things working so that when you, when it went to certain line numbers in the debugger interactions, it would jump to the same line in Emacs, but it's not doing that today for some reason. It's not doing it. I don't know how to make that work today. Anyway, here is the, what happens when you run RR. So I was using a special script um, to drive RR here. Um, in particular, it's the same, this is the same script to be clear as Rust GDB effectively, except that instead of running um, GDB down here, I'm running rr replay dash m and the most relevant thing here is this dash capital m flag because what that does is it makes rr's behavior change such that when it does the replay 
every time that it um, generates output, it includes annotation of saying RR, the process that's running, the process number that's running, and the event count for that. And the, way, the reason that's cool is that you can feed that, you can rerun the program and feed in that as a command line argument. Um, in particular, like you can do this at the command line and just say R replay dash A and it'll replay the program, replay the trace. You can do R replay and dash M in order to play the trace and give the event counts. And you can say R replay and give it the event count. Uh, wait, that's not right. What do you have to do? Mm. There's some way to do this. Well, the point is there's something about running it and feeding in that number that makes it, um, yeah, there's some about redo, replaying it such that when you're in the context of the debugger, at least, and you run the program and you feed it that event counter, the effect of it is to run the program, but stop when it hits that event count. So in the context of GDB, um, maybe that would have been a better way to demonstrate this in the other terminal. Um, I'm inside of RR right now, and I've got these annotated outputs. And so I can say, you know what, run the program again, but this time give it 766 as an argument. And the effect is that it'll rerun the, pro rerun the trace, but stop it as soon as it gets to event number 6766. And the, so now we've stopped at the point immediately before we start spitting out this error information. And so we can say, okay, I want to uh, look at my stack trace here. I want to start walking up my stack. And what I was just explaining before you noticed that I hadn't shared my screen was that um, unfortunately my setup is, if it was, if my setup was properly configured, um, it would be jumping within the source code every time I do this up here and I'd be like in the context of those lines of code. But since I don't have things configured the right way today, um, instead I'm gonna have to manually go to these lines of code, which is unfortunate to say the least. I'm actually wondering if this is an artifact of me building in a subdirectory. I wonder if I built it in, in the root, if the root of the uh, repository, if this would work properly. I bet it would. Um, so anyway, um, this is on line two. We're currently on line two, five, two, three, five, three, and that's where the diagnostic is emitted. And so I can like say, I want to print the diag. Well, is that not going to work? Why wouldn't that work? This is where I am. Uh, Nope, I don't know how to see this either. Um, print frame. See, I'm 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 helpless without like the Pronosco interface now in terms of being able to just see the local variables. Um, how do I see the local variables? Okay, frame. Well, I had thought this might be an artifact of me being on a debug optimized build. Like the fact that we can't see the diag um, variable here. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not I don't think it's worth me worrying about at this point. Um, the real thing I want to do though, is I want to see that diagnostic. I want to know how it's being generated. Um, so if I can't get my hands on the variable, on the local, the, um, you know what though, there's a simpler way to handle this problem. I'm the part of my problem here is that I'm doing a debug optimized build, but I happen to generate a debug build. That's not, doesn't have optimizations turned on. So I'm going to redo this experiment in that context. Okay. So there's, I've now recreated a, a, done another trace. I'm going to try this again and I'm going to look at the event counts, even though this the event count should be unchanged because it's, nothing's changed about effectively about how I'm running this code. Um, it is taking longer to run now, I think because of the overhead of this binary being larger since it's not optimized anymore. The, the counts did change. I don't think it was 770 before. I guess that actually the event counts being different, it actually makes sense because the code, the constructed code is different. It's, um, not optimized. So there's going to be some changes to the event counts 
though it's interesting it's that sort of that small of an event count change. All right, so we're jumping back up to the compiler, um, going up the stack until I hit something relevant. Uh, we're still in rusty errors. Okay, so back to the borrow checker. Let's see if we have die here in the frame. Okay, that's that's something. Okay, so now with a with a with a non-optimized build, we actually have local variables. Um, it might not. It, it's not the you know what? It's not just the optimized build. I, I'm misspeaking here. The uh, there's two things that are two changes that are relevant, and this really does matter um, in terms of people who are trying to develop the compiler. I forgot. If you have optimizations. Um, you can have options turned on, and even then, this debug info level is the other setting that's really relevant. Um, because the default, if you turn debug, even when you turn debug on, the default is debug info level equals one, and that does not include variable information. It only includes the line numbers. So when I'm say, sitting here saying like optimizations are turned on, I bet that's the problem. That could be the problem, but it's far more relevant that the debug info just doesn't include um, any of the local variable, any of the variable or type information. So that's actually the real culprit here um, that I probably should change in my local build. But there's some reason that I have noted here that I don't want to change it to one, change it to two. Um, I'll have to go look at that issue later. But in this other build, we do have this diagnostic information. And so um, I can presumably look at that in some way, um, in particular, or I could just keep walking up the stack. Uh, sh 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 what's the best way to handle this? Um, this thing has some structure to it, like diag level. So what I can do is I could just set a hardware breakpoint or watch location diag level, and then continue backwards, reverse continue. And what will happen now is I'll run the program backwards until that um, that watch point is written by something. So my intention here is to jump to the point where this thing got written, this diagnostic got written. And now that's what's happened here. This, we hit this watch point where that value got changed from some, some number to some other number. Um, and if I... Uh, if I walk up the stack now, okay, that's from the drain. That's just draining the buffer. This is like copying from one local variable to another local variable. It's not actually um, probably the thing I want to look at, but self errors buffered. Um, so this is a, a collection of, um, uh, of a buffer of values and hmm. Uh, let's actually do reverse next over. Where are we right now? We're in. Um, sorry, I want to make sure that part of me is like just wanting to make sure I also double check every once in a while that there's nobody waiting in the waiting room. Okay. Um, so. This is where we're moving all the buffered all the buffered things out of the um, out of that place. So let me let me take a step backwards. Hopefully this will work over that line um, because I want to get to a context where buffered has the contents inside of it. Oh, it did not like that though. I don't think it did what I thought it would do because I walked up the stack and I shouldn't have done that because it's. In the context, what I actually need to do is reverse finish a couple times. There's a distinction here. So what I did before was I did reverse continue to stop where the hardware watch point was caught. And that meant we stopped somewhere deep within like some assembly code um, and then walked up the stack to once to get to this point in the context. Because it's, 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 like it's like a mem move instruction that's doing this, this copying over here. So we're somewhere, we're not, the point is the program counter is not actually sitting in this code. It's sitting within the movement of this code up here. And I need to get myself up the stack. I need the program counter to be up the stack to sit somewhere in this code right here. And what I'm gonna to do to do that is I'm gonna say, 
I could say finish or I could say reverse finish. Let me say finish. Um, hopefully this will work. Yeah, okay. Now we are sitting, um, like our program header is actually within the context of this for loop right now, which means that when I do reverse next, this should actually take a step backwards within this code and hopefully set me up to be either, it's either going to be at the previous iteration of this for loop, which means it'll still, it'll say up, I'm here on this line. I can't remember the exact semantics of reverse next star when it's sitting on a for loop, whether it's going to actually keep going until it's exited the loop. Oh, they, they hit the hardware watch point again. Um, okay, yeah, that's going to conflict with things. I'm going to do a reverse finish, and what that'll do is instead of finishing going by going forward, it's going to finish by going backwards. Um, so it's running backwards, effectively, until it gets to the place where that call happened to the mem move that was, that was moving the, um, the data from one place to another. Uh, hit the watch point again. Um, and now we're at some other place within a filter map. That's interesting. Um, let me just look quickly up the stack to see where we are. Okay, that's all right. That seems plausible, maybe. Um, maybe. Let me do a reverse finish to get myself out of the context of this iterator function. Um, should I have done finish forward? Maybe I shouldn't have finished forward. There's a question to do, well, what, what to do here because I've got this this hardware breakpoint um, that's going to interrupt us periodically, and but at the same time we have to deal with the fact that going reverse does take a little longer than moving forward in the trace. Um, okay, we are in Rusty middle source mirror mod RS line four thirty five. Right, and this is go, walking through. This is an iterator that walks through the mutable variables and the arguments. Uh, and doing a filter map inside of there, I think we can safely reverse finish over this. Because I want to get to the borrow check code that's actually causing the error here that's, that's complaining about. I mean, what I really want, to be clear, <laughs> is I really should have looked at the, the broader um, picture of how the, 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 the pretty printing works. All right, bye, Matt. Nice, nice to have you here. Um, so, okay, we hit the hardware watch point again, where it initialized that to bug. Um, and now we are at some point, I probably should disable that hardware watch point while we're walking around the code and then doing continues and reverse finishes and things. Yeah, let's, let's disable the hardware breakpoint for now, because it's going to keep interrupting us and we're trying to actually walk through the code. Um, and let's run forward instead of backwards because that'll happen much more effective, much faster. Okay, so now we are in the, the borrow check library. This is where we are right now. Um, I mean, the point is we got some borrow check error that's occurring and I really want to know where this is in the context of the broader control flow of the compiler compared to the um, pretty printing. So I'm just gonna walk up the stack a little bit here to see if there's any um, way to quickly see information there. Um, let's see where this is. Related context go up again, up again. Yeah, the query plumbing unfortunately makes it hard. Like, you know, it just complicates things a little bit. Here we are. Um, in terms of dissecting the control flow of things, it's not like a typical old school compiler where the uh, you have a series of passes, except that when it, when it is, when it claims to be a series of passes like this. Okay, here is where the borrow checker is run. Um, and we can see that there's code here where it's gonna take the here and um, grab all the bodies and run the borrow checker on them. And the thing I wanna compare this to is when the, un when the pre unpretty code runs. Um, so, 
So the unpretty code lives, I think it all lives in here. We'll find out soon enough. Um, so we want to know about here. Yeah, preprint here mode. This is where it's this is where it's created from that from that parsing the uh, unpretty flag, and this is where it gets processed. And oh, we have an aboron error right here. If the type if it doesn't, uh, I wonder if that's what's going on in terms of it's deliberately aborting because it's got a type error. <laughs> Even though ideally we wouldn't want to abort if it's a biochic error hypothetically. Is it simple as that? You know what? Let's experimentally try commenting this out, and um, and rebuilding. And this is obviously not the long-term thing. There's a reason this is here, but um, it would be a very simple way to make some very quick progress on this in terms of learning more about why this is uh, the way it is. Um, Okay, sorry, I got distracted. I have set up to build to run the tests. I don't want to run the tests anymore. I just wanted to build, um, so I'll, I'll do that just so I, I remember that it's um, set up that way. That's funny. I wasn't expecting it to actually do much work right now. To do more build, more testing. I thought that that was going to be quick. Hmm. Probably should have passed keep stage one as well. Um, well, that's unfortunate that it chose to interpret my reinvocation as a uh, invitation to do more work. But hopefully the fact that it's compiling Rust doc is a sign that Rust C is actually built. This is building Rust analyzer proc macro server. Can I run this now? That's really my real question. Is it, has it gotten far enough along for me to run it? Um, so we want to try from the other directory because I'm now doing a deep uh, uh, even though I was talking about using the the, um, the non-optimized build I'm switching to the optimized build now because the rebuild for the non-optimized build is going to take a little while all right so let's see this hey look at that look at that Got it. okay so commenting out this line commenting out that line that I just this one right here was in fact all we need to do to get the here to print um, in its type form, for better or for worse, which is cool, because this is actually tell us something. Let's see. Um, I don't think this tells us anything yet about the desugarings. Let's find out. Well, maybe it does. Let's compare these two. So the actual source code that we're looking at um, is demo index. This thing, okay, and. The two relevant functions that we're comparing are this desugared up here. Um, let me shrink this window slightly. To give us some more room. So we've got desugared and we got sugary. And here we have desugared and sugary. And the differences, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, but that's only because this hasn't gotten to the point where it's actually turned into here yet. It's 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 just still here. So we're seeing um, this explicit index mute call here. And this is still sugared in the sense that it still has the operator of the index operator in this part of it. Okay, 
So on the one hand, we fixed the problem of, well, not fixed. This is not a fix yet. Uh, I don't know what the right thing to do is, but I'm pretty sure that it would be nice to be able to see um, these dumps um, when it's just a borrow check error, right? If it's if it, the type error, so it could be that the right thing to do here would be to um, make this abort call a little bit more precise in that to look at the actual error kind of error it has. And if it's all, all borrow check errors, then maybe uh, still allowed to be printed. Um, or maybe just change this to allow, I mean, the question is why is this aborting on error? Is there not a way to pretty print where we have errors in the output? Um, Cause that still might be an interesting thing to print if there's a sensible way to print it. If there's a sensible way to print um, that some types haven't been filled in because there's an error that might be a reasonable thing to do. Um, I'm gonna check quickly uh, when this, how long this code has been here. So this has been here, well, that doesn't tell us exactly how long it's been there um, because this could be an update to that line. Uh, so the right way to do this is, what I'm doing here is I'm using, I'm looking at the git blame output um, to see where that line came from. And then I'm taking that commit and I'm just going to see where it came from. Well, see, that's not going to tell us. I don't think that's. Uh... Oh, uh, yeah, see, see, it changed. That's all. It changed from being like a local crate to being a unit thing here. So the point is, it, this important error predates that data that line. That's okay. This, this interface, you can hit A to um, go back to the previous revision. Uh, where that line was changed. And now we have this, which dates from 2019 um, from this commit. This was when uh, something involving in every loops. That's ironic that we're gonna come back to talking about every loops again a little bit, um, despite its age, despite the, despite the fact that it's been removed from the compiler a long time ago. Uh, so let me, um, sorry, I'm just double checking again about whether I'm missing, overlooking anything. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, this, this presumably, um, whatever this slip, well, yeah, we can look at the patch itself and see what it looks like. Yeah, the code has moved around here, that's all, um, I think. So what we can do now is, again, hit A to uh, go back to one of the previous thing. And here we see that uh, some code from 2018 that was relevant here. And so we can jump on that, find out what that was. Make the Rusty driver and interface demand driven. This is a long, that's a long patch for that commit. They move some things around, but even here, reboard, abort on air was part of the code for pre, the type pretty printer back then. Um, so let's keep going. Let's keep going through the blame output to find out about that change. So a board on air here, again, dates from 2018. Or is this the right context? Hold on. Yeah, PPM typed, okay. Back when we used Rust C interface. Um, so, Pretty sure we're going to see another case where PPM typed. Yeah, another case where I think it just moved from one place to another. Okay. So again, we can uh, hit A here to go back in time again. Um, what is this from? There were two calls to board. Okay, PPM type to board on air. This dates from 2018. 
you're gonna trans the coach in everywhere. That's that's okay. Well, I, I can tell you already. That's gonna just mean you can uh, pretty blindly go. Okay, we'll skip over that. Hit A. Um, okay, PPM type. A board on error here. You know, there's probably some way within the annotate output to um, actually see the log, um, but I do not know enough about this menu mode to be sure about um, how to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, we can see the minor mode for annotate and see if there's major mode. Um, is there show diff revision that line? That's what the equal. In fact, shows the diff. Um, but what I want to see is the log message. Change show change shit diff. Um, show log revision line. That's L. Bam. Okay. So this was a change that did that. And if I hit equal, I'll see. A board on air. Oh yeah, this is not really a. This is not important in terms of what I care about. Um, so I'm gonna keep working my way backwards. A board on air here. So if I hit L, we see allow runtime stream to trans backends. If I hit equals, I see the diff is. Let me shrink this down. Um, yeah, again, this is not an very interesting change. Um, so let's go ahead and hit A to jump over that. Hit L. Oh, this was a way to write query providers and compiler controller. Okay, it hit equal. Let's see what the diff looks like. Again, not interesting in terms of what this, like the interaction. The, again, the thing I'm looking for here is something that gives you some hint as to why we added a board on air for PPM typed. Um, so let's keep going, working our way backwards then for a board on air. Okay, uh, ooh, this looks like it might, well, let's see, L. Initial work towards a board-free compilation. Ah, okay. Um, so this was something where, well, let's see. Let's see. Let's look at this log message. This actually looks like it might be relevant. Um, currently board at the top level. So we used to abort inside the guts of the compiler. This is back in 2016 that this change was made. Um, quite a quite a while ago, right? Uh, and so we used to have aborts inside the middle of the compiler, and we um, tried to shift to a model where you would only do that for internal compiler errors. But if the code had a bug, we would um, start, you know, passing results up. And um, for, for whatever reason, at the time when this was done, and a board on error was added here, or yeah, let's, let's double check that claim actually. So, Yeah, you can you can see this is where it really was added to like say okay if we have an error at the point where we're pretty printing let's abort formally rather than spit out output that is um, flawed and that's interesting and it's probably unnecessary at this point because we now like have no the the un, the pretty printing these unpretty things are totally unstable so it's sort of your my you know you. you what do you call it? Your mileage may vary, but you know, you own your own choices when you choose to use them. So there's an argument to be made to just get rid of the, uh, this, you know, conservative choice to abort now. Um, and just, uh, say, Hey, let, let, let's print If we can print with prints and otherwise we'll ice and fix it. Um, as we, as things come up, I'm kind of in a mode to say, let's, why not do that? But anyway, that's, that's, a little digging of the, the history here. Um, you know what I'll do? Uh, in fact, I will make note of the fact that this was added um, at that point in time. So this was from, this is effectively added in this commit. This commit. I'm just making a note. Um, so that I can reference the log message later. Um, in fact, even better would be to get the actual PR. And for that, I cannot use um, just um, the local Git interface. I need to do a search in the Rust repo for that commit. Um, 
which was PR31206. Okay, so the point is that I'm currently in the mode of saying we can get rid of that. And now I'm wondering, are there other calls to it that we could also get rid of? Like, uh, maybe, like for example, this one. This is the one that's for Theater Tree. Maybe we can get rid of that too. Let's let's say what happens if I get rid of that and rebuild. And this time, should I do keep stage one? I think so. Oops, 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 oops. <laughs> oh, I don't even know it's gonna work right now. Oh no. Okay, well we'll see what happens. It may have already uh, my failure to keep my, my typo there might cause us to spend some time rebuilding. Uh, maybe not. Oh no. Well, maybe, maybe not. I, mean, I don't know if it deleted it the last time I just, when I just ran. Um, let's see if it, if it works now. If not, I'll just rebuild. Um, no, this looks like it might work. Okay. So here type works. Does the or tree work? Uh, no, it doesn't. Am I in the right place? So that's surprising. I thought I got rid of the right thing here. Well, let's turn on, you know what? Let's turn on some debugging. Let's find out if we're getting to the point in the control flow where we think we are. So this is uh, Rusty driver, right? And then pretty. Okay. Uh, yeah, it seems like it did not get to where I thought it would get. Um, print with analysis. Well, you know what we can do now? We can uh, we can do the same thing we did before of, of grabbing an RR trace and walking backwards through it to see if we hit this point in the control flow. Um, sure, why not, right? It's not like I'm waiting for anybody else to show up. I mean, I'm not like, until other people come in, um, it's not going to matter, I don't think. Um, I'm going to quickly check to see what happened here. Okay, just Matt wrote some notes. Okay, let's, um, yeah, let's give that a shot. Well, actually, first, let me just try this and make sure that, yeah, okay, look. So, we, as an example, the debug output is working. This Rusty login function is correct in the sense that we see that kind of output there. So I, I just want to double check that I wasn't totally after lunch about how I was using the, the, the environment variable. So there's something wrong ha happening here where it's not operating as I expected. So I'll do another record of a trace and then I will um, see if I can debug this. And you know what I might do um, for the purposes of this broadcast, instead of using Emacs and failing to sort of work through it properly. What I'm instead going to do is I'm going to say RR replay um, dash M and then I'm going to use the uh, I was going to try to use the, 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 the TUI mode. Um, nope, that's not it. Hmm. Um, I've forgotten how to enter the, 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 the gut, the, 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 the GDB um, is there a way to pass control? Because I'm pretty sure that the way to pass, there's a, there's a, a GUI mode that, oh, I could just dash do dash TUI, um, control X, oh, it's control X, control A. There we go. There we go. So the reason I did this is because um, I'm hoping that it will allow us to see the source code a little more effectively. Um, so let's run until we get to air until event number 771. Okay. Um, and then walk our way up the stack. See, this is this is the way a debugger is supposed to be like, right? You, you, you walk up the stack and it prints the part of the source code you're in. Um, 
yeah, I I gotta get my Emacs working properly. Um, okay, so um, we keep walking up. We're still in, we're now we're inside of Rusty Airs right now, and somewhere in the Borrow Checker. Um, Which query are we inside of now? Lots of context being established for trying to execute this query. What query are you? Here we are. Mirror bar checking as expected. Okay, okay. All right. So yeah, maybe this is this is not surprising. Um. So the question is then, where was this relative? And this this was inside of passes.rs. in the rest of the interface code. And it was line nine ten. <laughs> yeah, so this is the borrow checking code being invoked, and the context of this is, is uh, analysis. So, if I keep walking up the stack, in fact, I should eventually see a place where it is going to make a call to the analysis query. I think. If it's not like, I mean, it might be that the query is enqueued in a list of queries that are going to get run, and, um, and so we don't want to see it directly. But I'm going to try to walk up it like this and see what happens. T6 analysis. Here we are, and print with analysis. Ooh. So that's the problem, I guess, is that we, yeah. Oh. Oh. Wait, did I not comment the out the thing oh it calls print with it did i did i do something silly let's see here um so this is inside of pretty.rs inside of the rusty driver line 421 oh i didn't comment this out um, but moreover, the, the reality is that it's, oh, it's saying print, do the analysis and then print it. Um, yeah, maybe I can just not abort here, like the same way I said before. But also, where's the code that I edited? <laughs> like, where, where did the thing go that I was uh, making changes to? Where am I now? Am I not in the place I thought I was? This is a, this is the wrong Emacs buffer. I, okay. All right. This is where I meant to be. And this is pretty with analysis. Okay. And yeah, there's a bunch of, sorry, I've got like a ton of windows, screen windows open now, and I'm, uh, I've got to figure out which one's which. Um, so this one is screen, how can I tell? Um, you know what? I can tell by setting the title properly. This is Rusty Dev. Okay, now, um, which one? And this is the one I wanted. Okay, and this one is the, the run in of our R, which I can say for title um, Rust RR, right? Okay, and now I don't know if this will help me switch, switch between things though. Um, how do I see a list? Is there a way to see a list of titles? 
Nope. Ah, there we go. Okay. How do I switch to four? I can see the windows by hitting Control Z, Control W. How do I switch to a given window? Um, select. There we go. And then four and seven. Okay. See, so yeah, I've used screen for ages, but I've not used it. I, I, you know, it's today the first time I've actually like attempted to set a title and use that to inspect things. Because usually I just try to keep my context very locally um, uh, located in terms of how I switch things. All right. So now I know which, screen, which screens I need to switch between. Um, and I am looking at, well, let's see. I wanted to go up further. Where did I want to do? Rusty driver, print entry layer, how you're lowering, we're in pretty. Um, hmm. Wait, now it's not going to work. If I hit control Z and then an apostrophe and a four, I thought that would take me to the thing that I was asking about. Control Z apostrophe four. Nope, that's not going to work now. Great, great. Fine. This is where I was trying to get to. Um, print with analysis. Check crate. I I commented out the abort on error here for the check crate call, but. Did that, was that enough? So this is inside of pretty.rs line 502. So, right, this is the line I commented out, but where are we in that debugger interface? So we're inside of rusty driver source lib rs line 314. Okay. This is print after pure lowering. This is inside of, well, it's inside of run compiler. Okay. I'm not even sure if this is the right place to be thinking of though. Well, it, no, it must be, because this is where we are in this code. And then there's the, low, the port on error here with print on independent with analysis. Um, where it's not necessarily going to print. You know what? I want to know more about that call, actually. I want to learn about um, what's happening there. So this is pretty.rs, print with analysis, abort on error. That's just where I was a moment ago. Is this not the same? This is, this is Rusty Driver Source. C driver source pretty print after here lowering. Okay, this is where I was thinking. I, this this is where we are in the other piece of code. Um, and so the question I had was whether this line, whether I can get over the board on Eric here. Let me see what this, what the history of this this bit is. Um, a board and error was added here in 2019. Well, no, we don't know when it was. When, we don't know when a board and error was added. We know that this is reformatting of calls, so we're going to go take a step backwards from there. Um, okay, and now this is make the Rusty driver interface demand driven. I think we can safely go backwards in time from there. There's two calls to abort on error. There's one here. Call with PP support here. Um, 
And there's one here from print with analysis. Okay, print with analysis, that's what we care about. That's the one we're talking about now. Um, and that's this reduce for us the interface and move some methods there. So I think this is probably a refactoring that we probably can take a step backwards from. Um, Abort on air here, print with analysis, abort on air here, dates from 2018. Name from, that's a rename from Transicogen everywhere, so go backwards from that. Abort on air here from print with analysis. And this is um, the Alex Crichton load rusty created transit runtime, so we're going to go backwards from this. Abort on air here. Print with analysis. Bjorn 3, 2017. Allow run time switching. This is all familiar. We, were, we already went through this sort of backtracking earlier. I just am double checking that there's nothing different about this case. Um, right away to expose query providers. Go backwards there. Um, and then. Um, no, what am I doing? I need, I want the annotate output that I'm looking at for revision zero A, annotate revision zero A C three. Okay. Oop. Hmm. How do I make my way back to what I was trying to look at? Interesting. Okay. Better, maybe. A board on air. A board on air. This is the context. Okay, I think this is the one we're looking for. Um, this is the one that's refactor pretty for oh refactor pretty more of the driver. Maybe, maybe not. 2016. What's the diff look like? Print with analysis is introduced here. It's hard to tell, but it was written in a way that it I mean, this is where print analysis is introduced. So the reality is that it was always intended to have a board on error right here. And I'm going to go ahead and use the same logic I used earlier, where I said, ah, this is dates from a time when the pretty printer was considered to be like kind of the stable, part of the stable interface of the compiler. We had hoped it would be, or, or we, you know, we thought it would be, should be. And I've said that we're no longer in that world. It's a dash D flag now. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, maybe remove the abort on error call here um, and just make it be print within it. But what does this mean then? If we do it this way, what does that do? Let me just think about this more carefully. Because it didn't print anything. It just aborted. And that seems wrong, right? Or rather, we're going to do something. We either, we either comment out this needs analysis call, but the whole point here is that this pretty printer does, says it does need analysis. Um, it, it's one of the ones that needs analysis. The tree, mirror, mirror CFG, they need um, the analysis to be run to drive them. Why? I don't know. I, I'm assuming that this needs analysis call is um, means like I need the type checker run. Um, there's only one call that needs analysis, this one. I suppose I could look at the context of when this code was in that, was introduced again. Um, um, so this was back with a board on air. Print with analysis. Wrong analysis passes board on air and otherwise. But this wasn't something this wasn't something we printed. This is something where we ran the analysis passes and, and aborted on the error and otherwise did print. 
And it's not clear to me whether we might have hypothetically gotten useful information out or could have could hope to use information out. I mean, it, this predates the year, for goodness sakes. This is so old. Um, so it's hard to like figure out how to apply the logic used at that time to the current code base. I think the next question is, well, what does print with analysis do? And why is that not, um, why is that, like, why is that exiting early? So for theory tree, I already commented this out. What is going on here? All right, all right. So now, now we come to the point where I'm going to go back and, and try to figure out what's happening here. So this, this print with analysis, where are we? Uh, this is called traced. Okay, because I've been walking up the stack for a while. Um, um, let's um, let's finish it a few times to get. Hmm. What? Oh, killed. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to like get, I jumped into the code at a place that was roughly the place where the, um, error was admitted. I admit it wasn't, I'm not hundred percent sure it was the exact right spot, um, but I just want to get us to the roughly the place that we were at before. Cause at this time, instead of going up the stack with the up command, I'm gonna, I'm finishing our runs um, each time. And the beauty of working with a tool like RR or Pronosco is that if it turns out that you were over optimistic in choosing to finish a run, like let's, you know, if we got here and then we're saying, oh, we're, we're at line 152, um, you can, I don't want, I want to line before it. You can see reverse next and it should take us to the previous line. Hmm. In theory. Yeah. Okay. So that's an example of like why this kind of tool is cool. Cause you can, you, you can freely say, I want to uh, finish where I am. And not worry and not worry about the fact that oh maybe there's some context you missed um so we will finish this too i think because i, I want to well because the other thing you can do is you can see reverse finish which i think i illustrated earlier when i was talking to matt okay so where was i um yeah the, 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 so yeah i already talked about this reverse finish runs back to the point where it's called and now we actually see it being illustrated in the context of a tool that updates the source context like the source presentation when I do the, do the call. Um, but the reality is that running forwards or backwards, it's, it's, it's cheaper to run forwards in a tool like RR um, because the way that the backwards runs are implemented. It's, it's, it's still very fast, relatively speaking, compared to some other tools, but it's, it's not instantaneous the way it is with Pronosco. So um, because of this, um, because of this, um, I'm going to opt for running forwards, um, rather than backwards until we see something that I want to inspect. So the whole point here is I want to see where we are running the analysis, um, print with analysis. Here we are. Okay. That's good. And it runs the analysis and presumably, and then that errors. Okay. That makes sense actually. I mean, or rather I understand why probe analysis does that. Um, but not ideal. I would prefer that we capture the error and still try to print um, and then return the error. So let's do that. Let's change this code. So this is in pretty.rs print with analysis. You know, one might argue that I could have um, done this much faster by just looking, reading the code um, instead of guessing, right? If I just jumped in the, in the top of this function, maybe I would have seen, oops, sorry. What were, um, specifically, print with analysis. This is what I'm talking about, this question mark right here. Um, let's, instead of that, let's capture the result of calling T6 analysis like this. And 
like that, I mean. And there's three cases where it'll try to do some pretty printing. And then after that, it'll just return the result. And my expectation here is that, sure, this might ice the compiler. Like, there might be things where in an error case from analysis that um, these other code, pieces of code won't handle that. But I, I am still in a mode where I'm thinking, like, I'd rather give it the chance to pretty print something. I suppose there's the problem that, like, if an error occurs and the analysis is outright, the, the pre-printing is outright wrong or misleading, that's the case that you want to worry about with a change like this. But I'm just not there yet. I'm not there yet in terms of believing that's the right, or, I don't know. Maybe the right thing is to have a Z flag to override this. Um, a Z flag on top of our existing Z flag to, to say, um, let me skip through, let, ignore the errors, and, and push forward. Um, maybe. Anyway, this is exciting though. We found, we tracked down um, the bit of code that I think is relevant here in terms of understanding the interactions between uh, where the pretty printer runs and where the uh, borrow checker is being invoked. And they're very, they're very much intertwined. Like it's not uh, quite as complex as I thought it was gonna be in terms of the interactions here. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see what this does. If I say I'm pretty fear tree now, oh, look at that. We now get a fear tree instead of an error. Now, is this readable? Mm, well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very long. It's 1.5 thousand lines, or sorry, yeah, 1.5 thousand lines, 1,500 lines. But you know what? That's okay. Uh, at some point, I've, I've considered, like, would, would we like to have um, a form of fear that's more readable? But uh, I've had some people push back and say that's not a reasonable thing to, to try to do. I don't know. This, I, I just, I, I don't know. This looks like something that could very well be translated into um, more readable source, in my opinion. Um, and since I'm already sitting here staring at this, let's let's do that as an exercise. Um, let's go ahead and see if I can take this code that's been spit out from here and mechanically or semi-mechanically translate. Not really mechanically. I, I'm not going to make an actual mechanical um, translating tool on the fly here. But I want to, you know, emulate a hypothetical tool. For a moment and just walk through this and see if we can um yeah do this in some way okay we have a def id there's the corresponding fear um already i'm sitting here going like what is what do these things denote what do arms what does arms mean in the context of fear um is it some sort of index structure maybe that's what it is maybe these are indexed things um let's find out what the structure of fear is I think that's the right answer to that question, is to say, okay, well, if we don't know, let's find out. Uh, let's see, we, so it's inside of mirror. Oh, is it middle and then inside of mirror? Source mirror, is there in here? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's inside of mirror build source fear. There we go. And how is fear defined? Um, there are these things, okay, but is this actually where fear is defined, fear, Or, you know, the other way to go here, actually, is to say, you know what, I want to look at how this is printed. Um, let's look at the pretty printing code and what it's doing as it processes this thing. I actually like that approach better here. So if it, so fear tree is, um, is a display implementation somewhere. Hmm. This must be a query. And that's a Rust analyzer, unfortunately, doesn't um, handle our coding pattern of using queries inside of Rust all that well. Um, so I'm going to resort to the uh, bazooka that is searching. Okay, see, yeah, we've got the query defined here and then the actual code defined here. 
I just heard some pings that imply that there might be something happening. I just wanna make sure there's no one waiting in the Zoom room because I'm paranoid about that. Okay. Um, so, CX theater tree, okay. Return the string, all right. It steals the theater, it matches the theater body. And then prints it. So, and then does a steal of that. So, okay, what is theater body return? It returns a result that holds some theater. And what is this? Uh, it's some sort of thing called theater with elements, and it has these elements inside of it. Okay, um, so this is a macro, some form. That creates a collection of new types um, for these named things. For arms is one name. Yeah, with ident arm ID and the type arm and or no, sorry, the value. Yeah. There's the name, there's the ident. Sorry, the name is an ident. There's arms is the name. Arm ID is the ID that's a type. So okay, like the first line there, this is arms. This is arm ID, this is arm, and then that's the formatting string here. Okay, so the point is that there's a correspondence then between, um, and all this is, is, I assume these are like index tables where we've got, we're just printing out the structure of these arrays. And if we see an arm ID somewhere, which we won't because we don't expect to, because this is an empty array, but like there's a, if we did, then this would be the table you'd look up to, to find the thing. This is an example why I don't want to look at this, this tree structure. I want to have things appearing in line. Um, well, it depends, I guess it depends on whether they're being referenced or they're, they're being defined. But I would, uh, the point is that this is not an ideal structure for reading. For humans, that's okay. Let's still see if we can make sense of it. So we've got, a set of arms, a set of blocks, a set of ex or a set of expressions. Oops. Let me save this. Um, a set of expressions. Here, let me do this the right way. Um, Emacs lets you have ways to jump over so-called S expressions. So you can go to the beginning of a array like this. See, Rust Analyzer is smart enough to know what the structure of Rust is to highlight parentheses. And once you have that, you can use Emacs's forward S expression to jump um, forward or backward S expression to go backward. Um, and there's there's keyboard commands that, that, that make this faster in principle, but um, I never remember the exact way to do, use them. So I often just type it out when I need it. See, like control meta forward, I guess is how you go forward, but it's not working for me on this key. Oh, geez. Yeah, I, I, this is the problem. I fool around, fool around, find out. Um, okay, so let's just go with what I know, which is to write, type out the commands when I want them. Um, there's one statement here and there's a set of parameters, okay. So in terms of how I'd expect this to be actually printed in practice then is I assume that a block, well, I guess that's the question. Is, is theor made up as blocks first and then blocks hold statements or is it a statement that holds blocks? I think from my reading of this is that we have blocks that hold statements, just inferring from the fact that we have a single block that itself has a single statement inside of it. So if I were to like do this myself, I would say, okay, the first thing to do is look at the first block and print that. The first block would be block ID. So I take block ID zero and print that in some fashion um, and try to preserve the information that's inside the block. What does block ID look like? Zero look like? It looks like um, it's got statement zero inside of it. So you know, I'm doing, I'm gonna do it like a statement identify form of this in my manual desugaring. So this is gonna be block ID zero that I'm working on filling in. Block ID zero has this content. Um, so what I'm gonna do for that is fill that in, fill in these, I'm gonna retain this information, this metadata as this stuff. But crucially, the, the whole point of what I'm doing here is to say, let's let's take 
the parts that I expect to appear inline in Rust source and, and make them inline. So now the statement S0 will be statement ID zero in the uh, and it's possible that you know we could actually you do B0. Maybe that's nicer. Say B0 and S0 the same way that the printing does. Oh no 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 no. Wow, I locked my screen somehow. It's amazing. There's no expression. So this is a block that consists of a single statement. And I can delete these things, this other metadata. I'm also going to delete the span metadata. So this is the only metadata that I'll keep here for now. I'm not even sure if the region scope should be part of it or not. It doesn't matter. This block is not targeted by break. You know, these are things that you, you should we conclude them or not. It's not clear to me. Um, but let's leave it in for now. Okay. Statement zero then. Uh, oh, and as I de as I um, as I discharge these things in terms of printing their definitions, I will replace them with underscores. Okay, so next we want to print out what uh, we want to translate what S zero is. So again, expires is here. We can do forward S expression to jump over it. Oh, and that's my time. Well, you know what? I'm going to finish this task. I'm still going to go through and keep finishing it, this task that I wanted to do. Um, I can keep recording, it's fine. So, um, um, okay, this is an expression, E21. So, it's no scope is node 16. I don't know the best way for me to see this is the thing a block it was somewhat natural for me to say okay we'll include that data as a comment at the start of the block for now at least but an expression expressions don't have the kind of structure that lets us add that metadata readily if it's not already a block. Um, the other way to go actually is to say you know what this metadata should be part of the tag like this b0 and then say all this metadata gets associated there maybe that's the better way to handle this in terms of the, the queuing of, of, of information because this way it's there's it's no it's not there's no ambiguity about what this is associated with it's with b0 let's do that for now okay so likewise for s0 then we will do the same thing of saying we'll take the information that's that's associated with s0 and plug it in as part of its comment. And we'll do some cleanup here of these things. And the kind, it's an expression. Okay, the fact that it's expression E21, that's discharged by the fact that we've got E21 right before here. I'm happy to leave that the way it is. And this, the only other thing is um, the scope of the expression is considered to be part of the statement and not part of the expression itself. That's interesting. I wonder if that's, but, but expressions have scope, dignity, I can have scope expressions too. That's interesting that there's a scope on the, let me take a look at what the statement structure looks like over here. There's an optional instruction scope and there's a statement kind. The scope of the statement used for lifetime of temporaries. Interesting. Yeah, okay, that actually makes sense. In terms of our value lifetime, so a statement has scope and the temporary things that get generated, the idea is that they will get destroyed at the end of that scope. So this is relevant for expressions. Um, there's an argument that maybe it could be part of, it could be incorporated into the expression itself, but in terms of what this but the funny thing there then is that's the, the optional destruction scope also serves. Oh, I, oh yeah, they're both node 16. So I guess that makes sense. Mm. But at that point, then the thing I'm now wondering is if this is, if the opt destruction scope is none, then does the scope here matter? Is there a way basically to reduce this further in the printout to be just, um, just describe this to name the opt the destruction scope when it's present. Otherwise, don't. And it could be that completely eliminate any mention of the expression kind here. But the other thing is, well, are there, what other kinds of statement kinds are there? There's let's. Um, that's it. Hmm. 
Okay. Well, you know, if we're not identified, we don't need the node 16 there. I don't think. Because that's only an artifact I think of. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Well, that's part of the here item local ID. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So if you look at how this is printed um, in this display implementation, because that's the relevant thing here, I think is display for scope. Nope, there's no display for scope. Oh, it's this, node. The scope data node prints out the node and does not include the scope. Oh, that's part of this. It's not the here local. See, I, I go and say things and then I'm just totally wrong. The, 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 the 16 there is not the here item local ID. It's part of the scope data. And that, oh no, that is that is the scope data then goes up and pulls the ID off of the node. That is that is the structure that it's saying here. This everything carries an ID and the meaning of that ID is um, then tied to the scope data enum, which is um, here. But it's, it's a simple enum that only carries a payload in this case. All right, okay, that's a way to do things. Um, Fine. The point is, this is a here item local ID, and we've got both the expression scope. Okay, that's fine. That's all fine. Um, do I want to keep these things? Mm, sure, for now I'll keep them. Yeah, we'll keep those for now. All right. So that I think has discharged our need to do anything more with this statement. So we'll remove this from our queue. Things to, things to write is defined. All right. Um, there are parameters. I just realized I jumped right into the blocks, but I skipped over the parameter to this, this sphere. So there's probably the need to actually um, include the, the list of parameters too in the sphere. So the first parameter is this one, um, P0. So all right, I'm assuming parameters are written as P something or other. Let's let's double check that. So that's under the fear. Um, yeah, see param, params is we've even printed with P whatever. So P0, how many params are there? Um, there's one. Uh, these, this should be, I'm, it's not, these are not, um, great insights as in like, it's clear. This is, this has got, this is a function that has one parameter. So it's totally unsurprising. There's one parameter P zero here, um, for the parameter list. And what's in that parameter? It is a pattern. What kind of pattern is it? It is the pattern, um, that has type back I 32. Right, again, something that we could learn from this. The most interesting thing here is that it's got mutability mute and name and the name V, mute V there. It's by value, it's not by reference. Um, its type is standard VEC, standard VEC, VEC I32. Right, so those, these parts have been discharged in terms of me encoding them in the, um, Output. I'm going to skip encoding the span. Uh, I don't think I would include that as pretty printed fear. Um, this is a binding pattern. That's unsurprising for this kind of thing. It's, it's, it, that's encoded in the syntax that we're putting out here for V. The mute V has been discharged. And the local var ID, does that need to be included in this, this printout? Um, maybe. Or no, it's that. Hmm. So for context on this, we are talking about the structure of this parameter thing. This is a, wait, did I? Param ID, it's a parameter. Struct par parameters is just a structure. It's got a pattern, a type, a span for a type. Okay, that's right. We're looking at the pattern here. Um, 
Yeah, the pattern I don't think is interesting. I, I think the pattern is entirely encoded in the syntax and I, I'm just debating about whether I can delete this entirely, not worry about it in terms of printing fear. Let's let's pretend that I can. I'm just gonna kill that S expression now. So I've got the pattern, I've got the type, I've got the tie span. There's no self on this thing because it's not a it's not a method attached to impl, it's it's so it's got no self kind. Um, and uh, here ID is this. Um, I think this would only be included if it was identified. I think we kill that off too. I, I might be overstuffing, but I'm not sure. I don't think I am. So with that, I think I can safely get rid of this um, information about the kind. Okay, the span I know I can delete. And this temp lifetime, you know these temp lifetimes, it is really interesting how much they are incorporated here. And um, it makes me think that the right answer for a printing of fear, given that everything has a temp lifetime, is that true um, in fear? Does every expression, for example, have a temp lifetime? Every expression does. Um, an optional one, it's an optional scope. So the lifetime expression, if it should be spilled into a temporary, um, should be none only in constant context. So that makes me think this information is gonna occur so frequently that um, it makes sense to optimize for it in some way to say that it's um, to use a more succinct notation for it. Um, like, uh, I don't even know, um, like temp 16 or something, um, or temp LT 16. Like, I just want to have it not be a three line structure like this in every comment. I'd rather have something smaller. Um, The other way to go would be like temp region. It's sort of at some other layer that it's a um, a region scope or temp scope. Like we've got the word region, we've got the word scope, and we've got the word lifetime. These are all things we're all floating around um, as concepts. A scope is this thing that's documented over here. I remember writing this, this comment ages ago um, that describes how um, the structure of an expression like this breaks down in terms of having distinct region scopes like nodes um, versus destruction scopes that are associated with the destruction when the structures run and remainder scopes. It's a whole thing in terms of modeling the behavior of blocks essentially. Uh, and so I think the way to go here is to say that there is a uh, a scope. Oh, I use the word scope here. I'll say temp scope, I guess, and then prefix it with the number with some with the. I can't just use the number alone because there's different kinds of um, forms here. But I can, at the very least, say n <laughs> for node and leave it at that. And if I do that, I think we can clean this up a lot in terms of saying, okay, that's what we use here. Um, likewise here, temp scope is N16. Um, we know this was a scope from the fact that it has this curly brace here. The region scope of that is different though. It's not 16. Oh, um, so I'm sitting here wondering, does that matter? 
So this was a uh, in the beer. This is an expression kind scope region scope. Like, it's really interesting that the temp lifetime, there's temp lifetimes, and it's very distinct from the region scope of this thing overall. Um, probably do need to say this in some way to like make, make it clear that, like, okay, the whole point of this curly brace thing is that it's got, it is a scope object, and it has this identif like identifying um, number because other things might use that in some fashion. So yes, but what's the best way to say that? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe just say scope and is n15 and the temp scope is n16. Does that make sense? That's what we had. I'm pretty sure. I can look at it again to make it absolutely sure. Um, So this was all in the context of um, Was an expression whose temp lifetime was node 16, and it was a kind scope, a region scope, notes node 15. Um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll do that for now. I think, though, I want to stop for a second. I, the rest of the time is going to be spent with how, like, this subtraction expression gets de gets printed in the beer, and that's not interesting for the viewpoint of comparing its sugary down here. So one part of me wants to jump into the actual translation of sugary um, instead. And I'm also wondering whether my time is better spent trying to figure out how to preprint fear itself rather than manually um, converting it into Rust syntax. I'm not sure yet. Anyway, thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see how this ends up in terms of whether I post it or not. All right. Hi, Matt. You're like, you again don't have a microphone. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Um, we can do it the same way we did last time in terms of uh, making use of either the chat session and uh, the, the HackMD to communicate. That's fine. Um, let me go ahead and pull up the HackMD that we were using. Oh, that's something. I hear you now. I do. I do. And hopefully the stream, I'm hoping it's recorded in the stream. I don't know if it, I'm not 100%. Actually, talk again. Talk one more time. Yeah, you know what? I'm guessing the stream actually isn't going to catch it. So I don't know. I don't know enough about about these uh, these systems to make the, to make my my screen recording software actually capture what you're saying too. But I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to keep talking. And uh, oh, good. That's a real that's a real bummer. I'll have to figure out how to get this right sometime. Um, but that's okay. I can just repeat what you say. <laughs> um, and yeah. All right. So. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to see anyone else. I'll, I'll try to keep my eye on the uh, on the, the Zoom window in terms of making sure I'm aware of people asked to come into the come into the room. 
Um, but other than that, we can get started. So uh, where are you at with stuff? How are you feeling about your interaction with things? Mm, okay, sure. Do you want to take a look? Do you want to take a look at that together? Maybe I, I'm happy to like either. Um, I mean, I, I will have to like, you know, probably reconstruct my own knowledge on the fly um, to some extent, but I'm happy to see what I can do there. Um, or uh, the other option is to me let you share your screen with us um, in some fashion. If I can, you know, it'd be pretty funny if I could manage to figure out how to share your screen while not figuring out how to get you to share your audio. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the, to, to just repeat what Matt said, actually, Matt, Matt just said he's, you know, feeling pretty comfortable about, they, they said they're pretty comfortable with uh, using debug statements and backtraces to sort of, you know, make their way around the compiler and uh, just sort of getting started with that kind of interaction. And the place where they're sort of most, most curious right now is with uh, the middle dot, the middle TY part of the compiler. So what do you think, Matt? Would you like me to try to like pull up my screen and, uh, and you know, you ask me questions about it? Or do you want to, do you have a specific question that you would like to drive with your screen? Uh, you, uh, in terms of the debug statements, actually, there's one more thing I'm going to do before we continue. Do you mind if I hit, I'm going to record on the Zoom thing itself so we can capture, hopefully that will actually capture your audio and then I can. This meeting um, is being recorded. So hopefully this will make things possible for me to post process in some way. Um, so your question, you had a couple different things. One was you said you had a small example already that was something you're working on currently. And within that small, I don't know if you mean a small example of a delta that you've made to the compiler or a small example of some input source code that you want to better understand what the compiler is doing with it. But before we answer that question, I just want to lay it out there. That I don't know which case you're talking about. Um, but within that, you're, you've said, you you know, it's difficult to map the internal structure of the compiler in terms of def ID, this long structure with def IDs and whatnot and, and mapping that back to the source code that was the input. I think that's that's the heart of what you were getting at there. It's a great, great question. And then the other piece of it that you asked about, I believe was about how to add debug statements um, or rather, and the interaction of having different modules that um, the way that the Rust log system works is that you get to opt into having certain modules tailoring which modules get the debug statements printed, right? And that's, you sort of curious about whether there's guidance about which ones to turn on or where, where to, or which modules to add debug statements to, is that the heart of it? Um. Basically, it's kind of like, uh, how do I know which modules to send to the output in the in the debug filter? Um, because I noticed, like in a previous issue, I was going through. Um, if I had this other module in addition to it, I would have seen the heart of the problem very easily. But I didn't know it existed, and uh, yeah. And found it Okay, that's a great, okay, now I understand, I think better. Um, yeah, just even knowing which modules to do it for. Um, all right, you know what, let's talk about the second one first. Um, so I put them on our like kind of, kind of queue of topics um, in our in the HackMD and uh, let me move the HackMD itself over here so I can have my, in front of my eyes while we're talking. Um, so yeah, so the first question of how to know which modules will turn debug output for, so I'll be honest, there's kind of a mix of responses here in terms of my own approaches, uh, because it'll depend on the nature of the problem itself. So um, so one, one thing to note, in case you don't already realize this, um, it's the, the debug system um, respects the tree structure of modules. Um, as in, if you turn, if you, don't know if you know that your thing is happening somewhere in like mirror transformations, um, then you can just say, I want to see the debug statements for all mirror transformations by just saying this, and this will, um, all sub modules that occur under that. Does that make sense? Like that, 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 that there's a, there's a whole EG, I don't, I don't know what's even a good example of this. Um, let me pull one up quickly. So like an example would be compi compiler, Rusty, near transform. Um, there's all these modules in here, like, so 
So if you have a sort of gross idea of where of what crate the thing occurs in, or even what submodule within a crate, you don't have to dive already to, all the way down to the leaf module. Um, you can start at a top level and see what, what output that gives you. And sometimes that's overwhelming because there might be a lot of debug statements in, in there. And um, that's, you know, then you have the problem of, okay, which ones you're gonna turn on. And the, there's not really, I don't have a better answer there besides um, skimming over the output and figure out which things seem like they're noise and and then um, selecting the things that aren't the noisy cases um, in terms of which, and I don't even know offhand if there's a good way to say, I want everything in this tree, except like at this subtree stop, stop. I don't, I don't know if off, off the top of my head if the debug system lets you say, I want everything in this tree, but then at this subtree, don't, don't do these. Um, it might be possible. Um, so that's the first, that's the first most obvious thing is to make sure you do that, but you may, you may already be aware of this, that, 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 uh, you know, approach the, uh, the next thing I'll note is that to be entirely honest, um, I, what I'll do is I will search for debug statements, like skimming over the code itself. Like I will make guesses as to what things, you know, I'll look at a stack trace and look at the, uh, so a second, I'll look at a stack trace and just see the chain of modules re referenced by the stack trace. Um, which I'm guessing you probably already do, do since you say that you're already um, making use of stack traces, but it's the sort of most immediate, you know, guess to, to sort of go, okay, these are, these are probably relevant, um, or at least it's a good starting point to sort of get a broad overview and then work my way down. And then beyond that, my usual approach is to just rep for debug statements, to be honest, like to make guesses about what modules might be relevant and then it's an interesting thing. Like you could just guess, um, guess modules, guess crates, compiler crates that are relevant. Um, and, and the crucial thing there though, is that I'll at least try to skim over the source code to see if there's debug statements in within the crate itself, because usually there's a somewhat of a correlation between if there's no debug statements, then Right, there's no point in turning that on. Not that it matters that much, but it's more about keeping myself focused um, in terms of just not having a long list of modules in the Rusty log um, environment variable. So, uh, yeah, I feel I'm feeling like saying these things out loud that they sound like you know kind of trivial things, but it's I don't have better options besides the only other thing I can think of is one adding your own debug statements. You know, as you as you work through the code. And to, in a debugger, sort of skimming around, like, you know, I've demonstrated using Pronosco and whatnot, like when skimming around in that through the control flow, keeping your eye out in that sense to, oh, I'm in a new compiler module at this point, maybe I should turn on the debug flag here. And the, the, key, the key thing that I will note for, note, for, note for that is that when I use Pronosco, um, there is an interaction here. Once you turn on, once you turn on another Rust C log entry, this produces new lines of output that a, a subsequent submission of the Pernosco you can interact with. You can click on it and get a feed feedback about what led to that line being produced, what data was incorporated there. It's not some. It's not always necessary. Sometimes you can make that same chain of reasoning um, by looking at the raw memory or the, the local variables on a stack frame. But a lot of times it's very if you can afford to do the submissions to Pernosco or if you can figure out how to use RR in an efficient way um, to get the same effect, then it can be pretty effective in terms of saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on debugging, do another run and take a look at where I'm at in that, that specific context. Um, um, so that's my, that's my most immediate. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking now and see if you have uh, feedback. So, I mean, uh, I don't know how useful it would be, and it would probably be a pain to to keep up. But um, would having just like a little 
reference of showing just crates that tend to be very closely tied that somebody can reference uh, that, that might be useful. As in saying, like, if you turn on, if you're trying debugging for this crate, you might well want to consider turning on, turning on debugging for this other crate too, you mean? Uh, yeah, so kind of like um, when I was going through my previous one, I, I was in her, uh, Rusty, her type check a mm -hmm. lot. And I didn't realize that um, it, it seemed to be pretty closely connected to the uh, infer um, crate as well. And that's I where see. all that stuff was uh, showing that I, I didn't see before. I see. Um, that's a good point. I think um, the first thing I would ask is, um, so okay, you eventually realize that Rusty and Burr, another good crate to turn on debug logging for. Yeah, I think part of that might be to, um, I don't know if this holds in general, but the first thing I'd ask myself is, well, does it use um, infer in this crate somewhere, like in the library, like the very, the root crate of it? And so like, for example, the, you can look for all the use statements that start with Rust C um, in a given crate. And that might give you sort of an immediate initial thing, set of things to consider. So in this case, it's interesting. It's all, the only one I see here is Rust. This is only a single line of Rusty infer. So I don't even know if this heuristic is going to work out well. Um, but let me just check if Rusty infer occurs in non-library modules inside of here. Yeah, I, my guess is that. Um, and the last thing, and the other thing to check is that the cargo Tamil. Yeah, this must have Rusty infer in it, right? So that might be a more general way to go is to say, look, look at the crate for the cargo um, dependency graph in terms of making guesses here rather than real. And the problem is then you've got to figure out which one of these, this list are the most likely ones to be relevant. But I think that it might be domain specific, like in terms of which, what problem you're facing. Like in some cases you might want to look at the AST. Um, I don't know. I would like to believe, what, what do you think that if you would look at this list, up front, you might have like you might have seen that Rusty infer was was relevant to your problem, or is that unlikely because there's it's mixed in with all this other stuff. You didn't know what Rusty infer, um, what its relevance was to what you were doing. So um, I think uh, that is like a good list. And then also, I just looked into the uh, into the mod uh, RS of the area I was looking at. And it also had, it was like a smaller list. So it like used mm. Rusty Fur and used Rusty Middle. So I could compare those two and yep. make a guess. Yeah. Yep. I can definitely see that being a case where, yeah, if you just look at the the source code, especially the mod.rs of whatever code you're looking at, if you're having to be in a, a, a subtree of the, mod, of, mod, of the module hierarchy, then you might also have luck look, just looking at the use statements that you see there. Um, so yeah, I think that these sound like plausible. Um, plausible guesses? Yeah, I think so. It's probably a little better than just random um, graphing. Um, um, yeah, so okay, that those both sound like decent, decent options to me. Um, Like it would, it would probably be a lot of output, but that would also mean like one less Bernosco upload. If it's so, are you? Yeah, yeah, of course, right. That's definitely something where I will very frequently like, I'll admit a bunch of logging statements more than I want to see in my terminal, and I'll send it to a dev null, and then send the whole thing up to Pernosco, um, and hope that I don't spend too much time. The only problem there is then I have witnessed cases where it's spending a lot of time trying to fill in its log, at least the standard out log. Um, when I'm trying to find stuff. So even Pronosco is going to hit that problem too. We've had some discussions with the Pronosco developers about whether it's some kind of, whether there's any chance of us improving the UI here, because there's things they can do within Pronosco itself. Um, I'll show you this quickly since you're already trying it out. Um, the, uh, the, if you're not already aware of it, the, um, 
Oh, darn it. I'm not, I'm not going to find this quickly. Uh, well, I'll try. The, uh, let's try here. Let's just see. Um, the thing I want to demonstrate is if you are at some arbitrary line in the code that you uh, are interested in. Sorry, so are you um, doing something on your screen? I thought I was. Oh, you can't see my, right. This is, this is the classic problem we had last time where I was doing some of my screen. You can't see my screen at all. Gotcha. I'm I sorry. Mean, I'm following so far, but. Uh, let yeah. me, let me pull it. No, let me try to share my screen in Zoom here and. Got it. All right. You can see it now. I have no idea what it's going to look like in the screen cab. I think it might be okay in the screen capture. Um, okay. So, yeah. So this is what I was just briefly speaking about. Um, so. If there's a line like this, I wanted to find it. See, the problem is I really want a more specific case to investigate. Um, well, while that's loading, uh, you see this is an example of what I was talking about in terms of this being a huge log that's, that's trying to load up right here. Um, so while it's doing that, I'll try to see if I can illustrate what I'm talking about elsewhere. Uh, runtime lowering, run passes, CFT limit. This might be what I want. Yeah, so let's take this case here um, where it's doing this for loop. <laughs> it's got some, uh, it's, I, I'm really pushing it here, I guess, in terms of whatever I'm doing to it. It's, I'm not used to it having to wait for a loading source like this. Um, so normally I'd be able to click on these lines and have it pull up um, uh, uh, actual, uh, one of the windows would pop up saying this line is executed this many times. And if you look at the, and if you click on the line in question, which I'm still waiting for this to load in some way that I can get to it, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to see if I can load this separate. This is probably such a bad idea, um, but maybe not. Uh, yeah, it's still not loading up. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if I click on this, it's supposed to say executions, but this is not, it's thinking it's never executed. Shoot in this run. Oh, so okay. you're saying that you can, uh, you, click can, on you, can you can, you can, you can click on things. So Pronosco itself lets you say, I want to print out um, specific data for a given line. The problem is I have to show an example where the line is actually executed, which means I have to find a spot in the, in the, um, in the execution where a line is executed. I have to actually get to a place where it's, I have to get find an example of where the thing is executed, which I thought would be easy here. Uh, you know what I can do? I can say executions of this thing. Hold on one second. All right, I'm looking at executions of this debug statement. It claims these things are run. No, I want executions of this debug statement. I want all of them. So there's, there's a distinction in this column and this column where this column is just things executed in this particular function call. And if you hit the line number, it's supposed to be all executions of that, that line number. Um, but let me, let me see if I can find a better example of this. So if I click on this, this goes here. I go up to stack to the code in question. That's here. Okay, so we run pass. If I say I want all executions of this, it's still saying it never gets executed. Shoot, um, <laughs> I'm 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 trying to find an example, but I'm uh, the example. But my go-to example right now, it's something I was investigating earlier, and it's not a particularly good one because of uh, problems in the run. Um, but the the case that I'm trying to show you is something where if you find code that's run. You want to see all executions of it. Okay, so this is an example. If I, if I click the orange line, it just shows you the single execution that occurred within this one function call, right? As in like this particular case in the stack, this line is executed once. So if I hit the orange thing, it shows you one execution here. If I click that, it takes you to that point in execution. If I click the line number though, instead of the uh, orange part, it shows you all the executions that are in the trace. The current one is highlighted in green, but the other ones are there too. And the neat thing here is you can say, you know what, I want to print some data. Um, and if you can identify some data that it's actually capable of printing, um, like children count, I just told it print out children count for all of these runs. And you see that it added this arrow with that number there. So you can get the effect of certain kinds of adding instrumentation to your code to Pronosco without having to rerun 
the thing and re-upload it. The problem here is you have to work within the, the, the interface of like, it's, it's funky, like C++ like interpretation of the code, which we have to figure out how it's going to understand the meaning of um, the different variables that you have in, in, in use. But like here, for example, if I say child, as an example, and then say dot private, it does print three, two, one, two um, on these various lines here. So this does generalize slightly, like it, it can handle print, anything that is able to print nicely in local variables thing, it's able to print semi-nicely in this output here. One thing that I have not figured out, I don't, there's some way I think it, to get it print multiple values. So if you wanna print, oh, it says semicolon separate expressions. So if I wanna do both child.private and some dead, then you get, by semicolon separating these expressions, you get comma separated outputs um, of the values that are spit out for each of those cases. This is not as good as a nicely formatted, formatted string that you can get from if you use debug statements. And I suspect there's some way to get it to run the formatting machinery from within this, like make a function call that would be format this value. But I honestly, off the top of my head, don't know how to make, how to write that. Like, I think the first step is to figure out how you write that within GDB. Um, directly, and then, because I think it's all Pronosco is doing is just doing um, effectively the GDB print invocations at those points in the con in the control flow. So anyway, this is a very long-winded way of me saying that there are ways to get extra data out of Pronosco without having to go through another uh, trace and upload. But at the same time, I too often will overestimate the amount of debug output I need in order to avoid having to do multiple uploads. And that just, and the, the, the only problem here is that you end up with output that has a bunch of output in it. And it'd be nice to have some way to tell it, to tell Pronosco, you know what, I don't want, I like filter out these cases from the output. I just don't want to look at them. But the current interface doesn't let you, um, doesn't let you do that in any way that I'm, that I'm aware of. Uh, quick, quick question. Yeah. Turning into Pronosco office hours. That's uh, okay. <laughs> um, is there any limits to the upload for Pernos Pernosco? Like, I mean, as far as I, as far as I know, I have not encountered, I have not encountered them apart from, I mean, there must be, you, you imagine there must be in terms of like the size of the log in question. So I shouldn't claim that there is no limits. Um, but I've produced pretty significant outputs, like, you know, logs that are the traces that are gigabytes in size and been able to upload them. Now, the outputs, the right standard out standard error, I don't remember how long those were in those cases. I'm talking about the traces being that long because of the amount of time that was spent executing and the amount of data that was incorporated into the, the log because the number of events that have to be tracked in the trace. But the point is, I've definitely had cases where Pronosco, I, I can't recall a case where Pronosco outright rejected my upload attempt based on some sort of resource limitation. The processing takes longer. I'll take, it takes like, I've had cases where I've had to wait an hour to get it to, or more to have it send back the message saying your, your, your thing is done being processed. So there's definitely a correlation between the size of your trace and the amount of, and the, the amount of time you're going to wait for Pronosco to process it and, and tell you your upload is ready now. So that's the, um, that's the, a big reason for like reducing your trace size in my experience, just because you do want that feedback sooner, but then again, if you're working within the free the, the free tier where you only get that first initial five uploads, maybe you're more like, look, I want to just maximize the size of my thing I'm uploading and not worry about um, the uh, uh, the what should we call it, like the, how big each one is, because I'm going to hit that I'm going to hit that 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 limit on the three tier soon enough, um, or even like the subscription the part of the, the, the cheaper subscription models also like it's not that many. Uh, uh, uploads per month, likewise. So I can totally understand not wanting to do a frequent upload cadence. Um, for me, I, I decided that it was worth the investment to, to get the, the 50 submissions per month tier. And so that's been, I haven't hit a case where I've been like, oh, I, you know, I, I need to be careful about how many uploads I do. Um, so yeah, that's, 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 again, a long-winded answer. But yeah, the, the, the short version is I'm not aware of any resource limitations um, on the uploads it's but maybe the best thing is to see if they actually say so um they do ask you to be responsible about it to be, to be fair um like 
uh, but I can't remember off the top of my head where that information is. Um, if anywhere. Yeah, I don't I don't know offhand of anywhere where they say you cannot, um, you know, you cannot do these up, you cannot do larger uploads. Because I just haven't encountered it. Um, okay, so where were we? We had another question, I think, about, or do you want to keep, so, okay, I don't, I don't know if the part of your suggestion there, I realized after you made some comments that this idea of looking at the use statements of the module and the dependency of the cargo to Tamil, um, I, I realized in hindsight, you might've been suggesting that like, could the debug system somehow do that for us rather than manually, like I was talking about as a human being reading over the source code and doing the inference manually. I suppose you could imagine some mode where you could tell the tell the system to figure it out for you, um, but that information is not embedded in the binary, to my knowledge, in terms of the relation, in terms of where those, what those relationships are. So it's not something where I would expect there be any way to like trivially tell the Rusty. Like I don't expect the Rusty log directive to say, um, do this module and include all of the modules that it references transitively via, via use statements, um, it would be a pretty significant addition to the, the logging infrastructure to add that capability that probably wouldn't be what you want anyway, is my guess. It's probably something you really want to do by hand as you're incrementally um, unfolding the, the thing. And if you wanted it, I would say make a, make a script that you know reads over the source and finds it and does yeah. the unfolding for you. Yeah, because I think the big reason why I didn't find the Rusty infer um, involvement before was because the stack trace was like all the stuff it was doing in Rusty infer was completing and then it was coming back and then proceeding on to like the next path until it error checking um, if the treat error as bug flag was was on or not. So I think that's part of why I missed it in the, the stack trace. Uh, mm -hmm. But I. I think using a combination of the the use statements in the module and in and in the uh, specific RS file as well as the cargo.toml, I think that would be a good um, trick for me to to keep up my sleeve. Yeah, yeah. It, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that that's better. Um, okay. So the next question is about the internal structure of the compiler. So I, I asked this sort of follow up question here because um, this is about the mapping between. Uh, uh, the long unfolded internal structure, including def IDs, et cetera, to the source code. Um, and I, as my follow-up question here though, to like better understand this, were you talking about a, a small example of like a piece of source code that you are working on and trying to understand? Or are you talking about a, a, a delta to the compiler you're trying to debug? Um, so, uh... Basically, I'm trying to alter um, code in in Rust C, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to do uh, like diagnostics and suggestions. But usually, at the point where I'm at, um, it's like a different uh, representation. So, having to think of like uh, uh, um, what's his name, um, uh, Michael Goulet was yeah giving me all these sorts of functions like um, to normalize the signature and to do these other things. And I wasn't, I didn't know how, how that, how, how you find those or, or realize that those are things that you can do or should do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, I, uh, one might argue you're kind of jumping into the deep end of the, the, the pool here um, in terms of those, those pieces, those parts of the system. Um, like, I don't think it's something that's, um, gonna be trivial to figure out like what are the right methods to call for any given uh situation it, 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 i think it's one of those things where it's it's not spelled out as nicely as, as one might like um there is some work to try to put all of this on a firmer separate theoretical ground um in particular i think the uh, the mere formality work might be relevant here um in terms of 
it's still in early stages because Nico's translating it from PLT Redux to um, to to uh, a, a piece of Rust code. But the crucial point is that this is meant to capture um, the 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 structure of like what the types are and how they work in terms of um, how expressions are type checked and what the system is gonna execute in the process of trying to mm, solve the problems of checking that a type, um, that, 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 that the mirror uh, meets a certain type. So I think that there's at least a hope there that this will be a better way to get a intuitive model of what's happening under the hood because it'll give you a more immediate insight into the the structure of the type system itself. Um, but that doesn't really answer your question because <laughs> even then it's going to tell you which methods to call in the rest source code to like make these things happen. I'm more just thinking off the top of my head that it's more likely you'll see things like a normalization step reflected very directly in the um, the frameworks of things like a mere formality. So uh, that's why it came to my mind as being something to to try to see this, but uh, that doesn't yeah that doesn't help you answer your question. I, I guess um, what I'm I was having trouble with, and like I said, I think this is just something maybe you just need time for, is learning how to kind of straddle um, the different levels of like tier and mirror or like these different representations. That way I can check if a condition is like uh, happens at one level and then be able to uh, output the user representation after that. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's certainly true. And I think that's a piece of this that we don't have today, but I was very close to trying to work on after our session, our last session where you weren't here for it, but I did, and I, but I did record it. It'll be up at some point. I did get to the point of printing out the 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 theater tree. I, mean, I can't remember if there or not, but I, I did eventually get to the point where I was able to print out theater tree as well as typed here, um, and that led me to then realize that the theater tree structure is. Um, let's see, am I going to find this anywhere? Yeah. So as an example of what I was looking at in the end. Um, which you might have already seen yourself based on your um, work was something that looked like this, except I had the places that are underscores or places. I've been in the process of trying to tr take this structure, which looks like here, let me just to give some perspective on how bad this is. Like this is some huge, huge um, tree structured code um, with all yeah, these that's lines. That's exactly what I see. Right, exactly. And I was staring at this, and this is meant to represent um, a, a really small example. This was this was something that was corresponding to um, this demo index code. That's like this, right? So that huge example that I just showed is only coming from pretty like tr pretty trivial examples. And so what I was starting to work on was to figure out how to at least turn this, uh, how many lines is this? This is what, like 1400 lines of output. I was trying to figure out how to, what a, if there were an unpretty mode for fear, what would it look like? And I started trying to manually construct what I thought it might look like. I haven't gotten very far because I was manually like trying to take each part and map it up to where I thought it would be and the output that I wanted while still preserving all the data that I wanted to, to keep because I wanted to, I wasn't sure which parts, I'll be honest with you, like looking at this output, I wasn't, it's not intuitive to me. If I were to do an unpretty T here or Thier, I wouldn't, I didn't know which parts would, could be dropped from the unpretty output versus which parts really should be encoded in some way, even if only in a comment um, alongside each line that's emitted or each, each expression that's emitted. So that's what I've been like, poking at a little bit. I think, to be honest, that this might be a good step because I agree with you that the map, there's a disconnect here where it is important to understand what the fear represents, but our current tools for inspecting it don't give you a source level 
intuition as to what it might mean. You really have to look at the raw data currently and figure it out from that. And it's pretty overwhelming. So yeah, I, I think my answer here is that I would like to see this change and to be able to um, print out a higher level form of fear. And I talked to Nico about this and he seemed like, I think that there might be some disagreement across the project as to whether this is a sensible thing to try to do, but at least Nico and I sat there and said, this seems like it could make sense to, to have a unpretty T here, an unpretty fear that would give you all that would give you the the low level representation in terms of like all those details that it's really turned into like the explicit function calls of the um tri resolved you know all the stuff about resolving traits and whatnot has been handled for every every case that's statically resolved and so having that be explicit in the unpre output but have it still look like rust code have it look like something that uses the um What's it called? The syntax. Uh, I can't remember the name, the acronym anymore. But there's an acronym we have for um, function calls where it's explicit. UFCS is the acronym um, for uh, for function calls that where you where you've made explicit the the form of the trait and the specific info itself. Because there's this 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 met this signature here. This this syntax type as trait colon colon method args. This is the kind of thing where I would expect to see this everywhere in the fear, because the whole point is that every statically resolved thing is going to have at the point where the call happens, the specific type that's called, it'll either look like type as trait or for inherent methods, it'll look like type colon colon method. But anything that's a trait method that's statically resolved should look like this in the, in the T here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm kind of expecting is something that would have that spelled out and would get rid of the projection. All the operators would be desugared, I believe, to their um, method call form. So add and add assign and uh, and index, index mute, all that stuff should get turned into function calls likewise. So I think that there's value in that. I mean, that's the, the part of what it was motivating me in, the, in those this the video here was to get that kind of high level view, high quote unquote high level view of the what two-phase borrows mean by showing the, the T here in all of its glory. The problem is currently all of its glory is too much low-level detail and not enough high-level perspective. Yeah, I, I think that there's I think there's work that can be done here. And currently for you to make progress, unfortunately, without that, you're gonna need to like, yeah, wade through these structures and probably draw some pictures or something to figure out, okay. Like for me, when I was doing this by hand, I was doing stuff like saying, okay, which expression am I looking at in this index, in this array? Because this case is where it's saying, you know, E10, and that means the 10th expression, or I guess 11th, it's zero index, um, in the list. But that E10 is not embedded, right? Like the, the, whatever E this is right here is implicit by its, by whatever index it's at. Maybe part of the answer here, you know, in terms of human readability would be to make the, the, the uh, tree form, the fear tree forms say the indices explicitly rather than leaving them implicit. That, that alone might be actually a nice step in terms of a human skimming this and being able to like use search functionality in their editor to find what's relevant as opposed to counting. Um, so yeah, that might... Uh... Uh, like if you have that there, if there's like a way for me to print that so it shows kind of like a like the levels that it travels through, like uh, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Yeah, yeah, like the depth in the tree or something like that, or the it's. I mean, yeah. this, this is not this. There, this tree is going to be fixed depth, to be clear, because this literally is just like it's not a. It's a tree. The tree structure here is implicit. I mean, there is a tree. Okay, there is a tree. The tree corresponds to the theor type, but the theor type is not recursively defined. It's just a bunch of arrays. And so the tree structure is embedded in the indices and the, the pointer relationships between these indices in the arrays. So I think if maybe maybe we're both reaching the same answer here. My point is that unpretty fear, not unpretty fear tree, but unpretty fear should actually take that implicit tree structure and make it take these pointers that are in the form of indices here and turn them into a, tr a printed tree with the nesting that's 
um, embedded in the tree that gets printed out, which is what I was yeah trying to do by hand up here. I got as far as I don't even know what, like E13 or something. Um, but like you can see that I've started to like, if you look at where the, the parentheses are matching up as I like, <laughs> as I like uh, mouse over these things, um, you know, the block, there's only one block, it's B0. And there's, this is E21, I think, or S, this is S0. And then this is E20, this is E20, I think, something like that. There's some um, correspondence here. And this is like the, this is probably E16 or something. There, there's some correspondence between maybe E17. So are you e sure what with the, with the E is? Yeah, the yeah, no, let me, let me spell it out. So what I've been trying to do here is take the fear and turn it into something that looks like rust. And as part of that, here, let me make a copy of this, of this thing. Um, so that I don't lose it from my future work. So the fear, when it got printed out, actually, can I print out the fear right now? No, I think I threw away my deltas. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to print out the fear right now. I think I threw away my deltas in this thing. Um, but this, yeah, I'll start down here. The fear that gets printed out, it's a collection of arrays. Like if I look at the type definition in fear.rs, um, is it here? Oh, right. It's generated by a macro. Um, <laughs> um, the macro that generates the air is, is down, it's used down here, but it has essentially five fields, um, arms, blocks, expressions, statements, params. And I bet if I go to the Pernosco link, I might even be able to find an instance of the here, maybe. Um, maybe, maybe not though. It's maybe a mistake for me to like waste time trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, never mind. I'm not gonna try to do that right now. The point is there is a structure that's the fear and it's got five arrays in it. And each array holds an instance of this, each of these types, like the arms array holds a sequence of arm structures. The blocks array holds a sequence of block structures where block is as an example, something that has these fields. It's, it's maybe it's targeted by a break statement. Maybe it holds or it or rather, yeah, it's, it's it, each block has a region scope and an optional destruction scope where the meaning of this is about um, how the structures are handled. Like you have temporary values that are built within the block um, or lo and local variables that are created within the block. You need to be able to handle just tearing them down at the end of the block. And so there's a whole, um, there's a whole thing here where we have a picture somewhere that shows what this looks like in the compiler source code where it says this is under the um the definition for the scope structure there's a picture here that i drew many years ago that shows how a um a method call like this where you're calling the g method on the value produced by the f method and then within that method call, you have a parameter you're calling, you have a, a, a actual parameter expression and it's a block and it's a label block and has a let within it, two lets and then a tail expression to produce the value that's the result of calling H on X and passing Y. There's a set of scopes that get created associated with all this, this stuff. Um, Cause the, the temporaries that created within this block, for example, have to get torn down somewhere. And I think that's D12, um, but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head that I'd have to look at this more carefully again. There's there's like one destruction scope for, the, for tearing down some stuff, that's D11. And I don't know what that's, I can't remember off the top of my head what that's associated with, although I think it's spelled it out. It all, it's all spelled out down here. Um, yeah, it, each of these scopes that's drawn pictorially up here is then explained down here as to what it means. Like D6 is the destruction scope for temporaries created during the execution of M5, where M5 is this prefix of the block that's inside of here. There's going to be some temporary, there might be temporaries created within this part um, that have to get torn down in this very short time span. It turns out that in this actual code, there are no such temporaries because D itself gets created and then bound to X. So this destruction scope D6 is trivial. But you could imagine other cases where there's some intermediate expression that gets computed and then and then thrown away after it returns its value, after you return a value by 
extracting some value from it. That's that's the case that we're trying to cover here, is the case where you want to handle those destructors that need to run from temporary values that got built up and then can be thrown away immediately. So, uh, so this is this is um the the, the, how that kind of code is implemented is in the scope stuff and what, thus the actual representation within the fear for a block has to handle it it has to have these potential destruction destruction scopes that hold the code that's going to be run for tearing down the temporaries that were generated when this block was executed and then perhaps for your purposes though the most relevant things are um a block is made up of a series of statements, which might be empty, followed by an optional tail expression. And those are built in, those are represented here and here. But the crucial point is that we don't put the data for the statement in line within the block. Instead, we use a statement ID to point to the statement structure that's held elsewhere. And so these IDs like statement ID and expression ID are acting as conceptually as pointers. They aren't actual pointers in the sense of like pointing to memory directly, they're indices in an array. So the statement ID is going to range from zero up to N where there's N statements in the block, presumably. Uh, no, sorry, that's not right. That's not right. Sorry. They're not going to range from zero to N where N is the number of statements in the block. They're going to range between zero and N where n is the number of statements in all of the fear in question. The given piece of fear is going to have a whole bunch of statements within it, and the block, each block can refer to um, those indexes within the fear. So if you look at so if you look at the um, examples of this, there's an expressions array, and if you have e0 somewhere, for an expression ID, right? If some block has E0 as the expression ID for its tail expression here, that means that you find the data for that expression as at index zero for this expressions array. Um, why aren't we using pointers, right? Like you might say to yourself, why aren't you using a pointer to represent this instead of using indices? And the basic answer is that Rust doesn't handle interior um, pointers well you'd have to use unsafe pointers a bunch of the places or or some other or arcs or some way of re handling the the internal referencing cyclic cyclical referencing relationship we're talking about because the fear is carrying the data and has within it other data that points to things that are held in the fear and so you have a choice in rust about how you're going to handle representing those kinds of cases you can either use unsafe pointers or you can use things like rcs or arcs to handle cyclic structure like that, potentially cyclic structure, or you use explicit indices um, and you have arrays that handle the, the, the representation of the backing storage of the data and then the indice and the in these indices point into those arrays. And now finally we get to then what have, what has Felix been talking about this whole time with this E0 business. The, the point is that when the fear gets printed out, um, any case of an expression it's gonna look like E0 or E2, et cetera. And that's represented in the fear um, by that macro that I showed you. Uh, where is it? A fear with elements. This macro expands into something that says, look, the arms field is actually representing a mapping from arm IDs to arms. It's an array where the effectively the, the index of the array is always gonna be an arm ID. The elements of the array are going to be arm values of type arm. And when you print these things out, when you print the indices out, print them as A and then the number, the index. So in the fear tree output that we see, if you see something that has like a B, um, I've already done some, some processing of this, of this fear tree output. So we might not find any cases that say B. Um, uh, I mean, well, let me try anyway. Um, I don't think we're going to find anything that says it, but I'm going to go ahead and try. Uh, oh, I found one. Okay. So like here, there's a block B0. And so that's saying this expression um, 
whatever an expression is in this system. Uh, okay, right. Expressions can be blocks. And so the block that this expression is, is B0. And that's, that's what this representation is just saying. It's, um, and then if you want to find out what the block that is, you need to go and look at the blocks field. Now it turns out that in this code, I've already translated. This isn't the way the printout looked. Originally, this had something here. But when I was doing this translation process, I've been taking each piece that I sort of guessed was supposed to be translated, and I moved it up and left an underscore here. So that's why you're not seeing the full output. And if I had a local build of this branch, I'd print out the actual theater to show you, but I, uh, I don't. Um, does that does this answer your question in any way? <laughs> I'm not, well, it, it kind of makes me appreciate that it's not a simple subject that uh, I don't feel too bad about struggling. Um, yeah, no, this is not simple. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, impressed that you that that you feel like you've made progress, given this is the kind of roadblock you have in front of you of like trying to make sense out of this structure. And it's not obvious what these things mean. Um, to someone who's not used to it. Thankfully, um, the the Zulip chat people are, are very helpful. So I'm able to leverage their experiences in order to figure out kind of how to stagger um, the representations for now and Hopefully, I can kind of make that a bit intuitive. In terms okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, there are other things in here that are mixed in, like these other kinds of IDs, by the way, and they are like the def IDs. And these are more sort of, uh, these are broader notions. Like the things like these, these expression IDs and block IDs, these are things that are just defined within the fear, right? You can sort of infer that from the fact that expression ID, well, okay, actually, this again is all the macros are the things that are generating right this this form so i can't just search for those i cannot search for struct expression id it's not going to turn up because um the definition for instruction id is coming from the expansion of this macro but the point is that these five ids are local to fear they are they're exported they have a pub struct definition here but they are just used solely for indexing into these arrays that are part of the fear itself and people who aren't using fear won't know about this won't use it um so and, sorry sorry go ahead oh it's okay i so i was trying to get a, make my way to saying is that def id is different in that it's far more um it's used like in all kinds of places in the compiler it's got because it's defined it's not, I mean, this is also the, okay. So the, these expression IDs and stuff are part of Rusty middle, but they're part of Rusty middle fear, right? So if you don't see someone importing Rusty middle colon colon fear, um, right? If you don't see, if you don't see use Rusty middle colon colon fear somewhere in the code that you're looking at, then they're not gonna be making use of things like the expression ID, um, the, the fear expression ID. But something like def ID is used all over the place because it's a common um, notion that starts from like a much higher, a much earlier on the compiler. It's 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 coupled to like the the, the IDs that are printed out. It's our way of sort of uniquely identifying um, pieces of the source code uh, across crates. Even this is the structure of a def ID says. I encode the crate, the number of the crate I came from, um, as well as the the index. Uh, the, there's, a, there's the crate, and then there's the index within that crate that this def ID corresponds to. Um, and so this is the way that we uniquely identify all the definitions that are in a program um, that you built up by pulling in a bunch of crates together. And there's they're globally unique while the local def ID is, I believe, locally unique. Um, like this is something that's um, only meaningful with respect to the crate that's currently being compiled. You, and, 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 uh, and, to, and this is a similar thing where there's gonna be a, hmm, it can't find def index, that's unfortunate. Um, where is that defined? Oh, is it defined in here? I see. Yeah, 
So there's a similar kind of thing to what I described before about the array of expressions and blocks and stuff that the fear holds. There's a similar structure for um, for here, which that that says, okay, we're gonna have a def index into a an array that we're calling a here map. Um, and so the point is that these def indices are indexes into some array somewhere that tells you how to look up a definition within the here. And, but the meanings that these indexes depend on, it doesn't, each index can either be a local index, a local def index, which I was showing earlier, um, or a global one. And so that, that's, that's all. I was just trying to like point out that there's a distinction between um, a def index that's implicitly about the current crate that's being compiled. We don't pass around def index, every, we don't pass around def ID everywhere to be clear because it's, it's bigger, <laughs> it's costly. And we could like hypothetically, you can imagine a compiler that did just use def ID everywhere. And the problem was that you'd be paying for the cost of passing around a crate number unless it's embedded in, unless you are on a target that didn't yeah you can look at this code and you can tell like there's this whole thing it's doing where it's saying um well, am i right about this i'm not sure if i'm reading, reading this the right way there's both a oh, oh 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 okay never mind these are always two separate indices what this config flag is controlling is what order they occur in this is like the crazy kind of low level detail you get into where like it's it's controlling the low level details of what order these indices occur in within def id in order to like control the entropy of the hashing of def IDs themselves. So that's super low level detail. The point is that a def ID is always gonna be two of these things um, where a def index itself is um, probably 64 bits, though I'm not sure about that off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't know if it, it's probably a U size. I'm honestly not sure off the top of my head. Is there a way I'm going to find this quickly? Probably not. Um, I'm going to say it's 64 bits is what I'm going to say. Um, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to say that. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but it seems plausible. So yeah, the point is that um, it's expensive to carry around both that, carry around 128 bits for both this field and this field. And so instead of doing that, we have a local def ID that is just one field and you use that everywhere that you're only going to talk, you know, you're always going to be talking about just the local crate that's being compiled. Uh, okay. Um, so probably information you didn't need or want, but uh, I figured it was worth pointing out because it happened to coalesce with what we were talking about earlier with the uh, representation of fear. I'm now sitting here wondering how well this is explained in the Rusty Dev Guide. Um, Because it talks about the fact these things are built up as identifiers. Um, and then somewhere else talks about the, the here. Oh, I see. We just point to the code or the, the, the Rust doc. Okay. Um, I was curious whether there's going to be a place to like point out, points out how this thing is stored in terms of like the fact that it's a, a potentially a, a, an array. Um, that you look up, but this is this is what they, I guess, we're talking about is the here map. But yeah, as far same, as the the def ID and stuff, I didn't remember any anything talking specifically about like an array structure. Yeah, and maybe it's not. I mean, maybe it's a level of detail that we don't necessarily want, but because we do talk, because conceptually, you don't really care that it's an array. What you care about is that it's a, a separate map, and that, that there's no tree, that the nesting that occurs is not. Um, built in to the structure of the code itself. It's not something we are not building up a tree structure that has the nesting built into the actual pointers that are allocated in the compiler and the embed and the, the referencing structure of the, the, the structure there. And what this means is that in a debugger like GDB or others, it means you don't need to ask to print things. You're not going to see it print out a tree. You're going to see it print out a single level. And you have to figure out yourself, ah, there's an index here and I have to go look up what that index corresponds to. If I wanna see what the next level of the tree looks like, what the child elements are, 
I have to find the node associated with the indices that I'll see explicitly spelled out in uh, the data structures that get printed out in a debugger or in um, things like the the printout of the of the of the theater tree that we saw earlier. Um, right. This is an this is an instance of that kind of case where unfolding things like an expression, you could imagine a world where you would print out the block itself, the data associated with B0 would occur directly inside of here. Um, but the only place where that, but we don't do that because the expression value in the compiler does not own that data. It doesn't have a boxed owner. It doesn't have a box reference representation here. It doesn't, it doesn't have an ampersand reference to a block. It just has this index. And so to get that unfolding of the tree structure, you have to manually look up um, the cross-referencing that happens here. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of curious whether like your, how you're been handling your investigations in the type system then, um, cause I haven't looked at that lately. Um, and I'm curious whether you've encountered a similar kind of, similar kinds of questions about how types are represented, or if it's like a big black box that you can happily sort of interact with and not worry too much about the internal structure of them. Uh, I think, um, I still haven't leveraged all of the available information for like internalized it what's available on the rusty dev guide um to even to even really look too much deeper into the the lower level structures i mean it's definitely giving me stuff to connect to um as i go through things mm -hmm. uh, but yeah i think like i said i think before it's just time and and kind of trying to get used to things yeah um, i, I reached, told you I reached the part within the rusty dev guide um I haven't gotten to the point where I can say that there's things missing in the Rusty Dev Guide. Yeah, I can believe that. I mean, I, well, I can, there's definitely things missing, but I think that it's very much a, a reference, right? And it's, it's, it tries at points to try to like, you know, ease you into certain topics, but it's definitely something where you're not gonna get a kind of gradual um, introduction to the to all the pieces necessarily. So, um, but okay, I, I was mostly just curious about how your experiences were about this um system there's there's there is material here that's worth looking at and it's it is different from how the expressions are handled in particular like we do do it unlike unlike what i was saying about all those other patterns we were talking about where there's these those indices and an array or a map somewhere that maps those indices to the data in question and um it, it's I think in the case of the type system, you see more instances of things actually like having direct references to other types, as opposed to having this level of indirection via an explicit type. Like, I don't think there's, I could be wrong. Actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say this off the top of my head. I don't, I don't know at the top of my head if this is the case or not right now. Um, but I was gonna say that, I was gonna say that I don't think you see the same kind of pattern, that's all, in terms of like there being an ID, a type ID that you have to look up in a map. Um, I think that it's it's more uh, it's more like a graph structure where the types themselves have references to other types directly, rather than having a, that level of indirection where a type would have a type ID and you have to look up what that type ID is elsewhere to find out what it means. Um, because the way that we handle types in the compiler, at least the tie ties, which is not the which is different from here ties. Um, the tie ties are dealt with as a um, as intern structures, and in particular, I'm pretty sure that if you look at tie kind, just pull it up rather than guess, just pull it up. And that's what's uh, referenced when you do like dot kind, right? When you call that method. Yeah, yeah, because the tie kind will the tie kind does look up the um the kind structure for a type. So there is a kind of relationship there that you know you could you could think of it as a distinction between an index and a um and a um you could think of it as the distinction between an index and its corresponding payload, but the difference is that well let me think about this the right way. Um if you do kind
I'm not gonna find kind easily. Um, I wanted to see an example of where like these types are referenced in Thai kind, but I think there's a level of indirection that's happening here about how these are Im implemented now. Um, yeah, because there's this interner, there's this type parameter called interner that handles the actual representation of what a, how they are cross referenced. Um, but so you have to look at how Thai kind is implemented for a particular type. Um, which, what did I want to, where did I want to see that? Thai kind, am I going to find that somewhere easily? Hmm. Shoot. Um, it's a, a little bit of a, a digression, but how sure. does uh, Russ sees representations of types compared to like, or uh compared to like rust analyzer because you know you're talking about rust analyzer before and i've been doing a little bit of research into it i'll be honest with you i don't know off the top of my head how rust analyzer represents its types um so i don't know i think that rust c has gone through a couple different it's gone through some iterations but it's every change we make to our to our compiler has to sort of go through a there, there's a there's so many changes that are there's some changes that are about trying to clean up the code but many more that are about trying to make the compiler faster and so I feel like there's a lot of changes that happen that make the code less readable um, in the name of you know making the compiler faster. I don't think Rust Analyzer has quite the same problem because its structure is that it's already built to be incrementally evaluated. And so it, I think, gets to get away with slightly less efficient implementation, or at least I think it can afford less efficient implementations in some cases. Um, shoot, did I miss a chat from somebody? No, 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 um, that was me. I was trying to paste oh, it on okay. the it's oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know off the top of my head enough about how Rust Analyzer analyze how Rust Analyzer represents its um the types to answer your question about how it compares. Like I I saw a presentation from um about Rust Analyzer that talked about how it represents the the syntax tree, which I remember because they were they were they were because MATLAB was was describing like ways in which the the Rust C kind of approach was uh was outdated. And that they were, you know, making use of some newer approaches. But off the top of my head, I do not know. And I would be a matter of guessing in terms of me looking at the code and saying, um, hey, what is this doing here? I just don't know. I think um, that, yeah. I've, I've seen from like a kind of a high level, at least how it, um, I don't know if I'm using the right terms, like lexes and parses, uh, the input. It's yeah. fairly... Simple, it's, it's right? Fairly, fairly simple, yeah. Um, so, the, the, but there is a there's a crucial distinction here, though, that um, I suspect that the very first level you're talking about of what the um, of what the type what Rust Analyzer is doing will correspond to the syntax trees representation of types, and that is more like what Rust C here tie is doing. Um, and there's a distinction between the tie that you have for the abstract syntax tree versus the tie that you have in terms of the semantic analyses the compiler internally is doing. And so this, ch this, this chapter is very relevant in terms of understanding this distinction because the very first level that Rust Analyzer is gonna do is gonna be about recreating what Rusty here tie is. I don't know if it has an analog to the semantic um, notion of a type that corresponds to tie tie. I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, how it's handling that because I don't know, I don't know how much, how close Rust Analyzer gets in terms of how it handles. In order to figure out the types for things, at some point you have to do a certain amount of inference and you have to do, and you have to figure out how methods resolve. You have to like figure out how the trait system works and how associate items will work and so on. And I just don't know off the top of my head how far along Rust Analyzer is with those analyses. Um, it could well be that it has sophisticated notions and is able to do a lot of um, work there, or it could be that it uses naive heuristics and doesn't have any kind of, like I, I could very easily believe that it hits a roadblock quickly when it comes to um, certain kinds of method resolutions of trait, like how a trait how a method call and a trait resolves and having to figure out, well, what is the type 
that the type inference system figured out for this method for, for this for this expression in order so, to figure out which for, what method that resolves to. I, I think uh, my naive notion of how Rust Analyzer worked was that it was basically doing a partial compilation with like Rust C or something, because that's what it kind of felt like using it. It's like it's telling you what the compiler's error are going to be before it even runs the compiler. It does. I know that it will invoke the compiler for some of the things it does, but there's other other analyses that it does that don't use the compile use the Rust C itself. So that's I guess the question is like which parts of it. Like the, the compiler, in particular, the compiler used to have pretty strong support. The compiler used to have this thing called the 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 RLS, the Rust Rust language service that support that. It like had a whole system of spitting out all the metadata the compiler had generated about the cross-referencing relationships in the source code. And we basically stopped supporting that. Rust Analyzer deliberately said, we're not using that system. It's too expensive to reprocess the entire source code body in the compiler every time someone makes a uh, one character edit. And you need to make, use a more incremental system internally, directly, which the Rust compiler does, did not support at that time and still doesn't support today in terms of the uh, the, the kind of user experience model you need to have to support this. So there's parts of Rust Analyzer that are definitely doing its own parsing and its own analysis of the AST in order to do suggestions and whatnot of, of method resolution. So I think the best thing, well, I don't know about best. I If I were to investigate this, I'd probably try to like dig a little bit into what Rust Analyzer is doing in particular, I probably would start by figuring out how it even does its suggestions um, for methods and stuff. So there's got to be some place in here where it's got the, uh, yeah, the complete, like the completion, for example, is the place where I might start looking to sort of get an idea of what, of how it figures out um, the, the code to call in various places. And part of this is going to be at some point, like figuring out the types for a given expression. And it could be that it, like I said, it could be that it uses a very, a relatively naive local analysis that's just based on a local traversal of the syntax tree to figure out what types are immediately apparent from this, from the structure of the syntax tree itself. Um, I just don't know enough about Rust Analyzer to answer the question. I, they do have a community though so you can definitely ask there to like get some insights they, they, they might tell you how wrong i am about what it's doing and point out like how it's got its own implementation of the rust type system or if it's is indeed leveraging the rust compiler in some way that i'm not familiar with um but i there's things it does certainly it runs the rust compiler in some cases to extract the actual errors that the rust compiler has and processes those and gives them back to the user those kinds of interactions, I know that it does and it leverages the Rust compiler to do them. It's more these things about, in particular, the, the, these, these things that require very fast interactive cycles and it's things like um, code completion and methods and suggestions that, that happen within the IDE itself that because they have to go fast, they had to be re-architected within Rust Analyzer. And um, it's just a question of how they're figuring that out. So unfortunately, I can't, like, I think the best thing for me probably would be as a personal exercise to try running Rust Analyzer itself as a binary on something, because that's something you can do and feed that to Pernosco or something. Find some way to like traverse this code um, on a concrete example and use that to explore its behavior better. Because I don't have answers off the top of my head about what happens here, but this is the kind of these, the executions of methods like this, where it's saying like, um, figure out, what the uh, possible completions are for a function called in a particular trait implementation is the kind of thing that I think is um, the place I would look at for what it's doing um, as, as a guess. And it's quite possible that uh, in all these things, a lot of times it's entirely reasonable in some user, in some IDEs just give up, right? And not produce partial answers and not have the complete story. It's not a compiler, it doesn't have to have the fully correct, fully elaborate set of candidates for a method call, it's not responsible for producing that. It wants to get something as close to the actual compiler as possible, but it doesn't have a responsibility to get it right the way the compiler does. So um, yeah. I wouldn't I, be surprised. Uh, there, there's a 
very long YouTube series where they go into every aspect of the Russ analyzer. It's like an, mm. almost an hour for each episode. There's like 40, I think, in that playlist. Um, and I, I went through a few of them. And uh, I, I remember uh, one of the parts, the, uh, they, they said that Russ analyzer is based off of the language and not off of the, how the compiler uh, works as yeah. it's trying to give suggestions based off what would be correct according to like Rust as a the language. language. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, I think that sounds right. Um, and the question is, how is that working, right? So like, for example, I might, if you're interested in like the type, how it's handling the type system, you might consider jumping straight into like the things that involve um, how it does type checking. Uh, I'm guessing that this overview, this this video probably has some some explanations of what rust analyzer is doing um so it is old this is three years old so it's possible it's out of date at this point um but it's still might give you some perspective about that i'm still curious about well anyway that, that, would, that would be what i'd be curious to see is discussion of how they represent types um that isn't just the type it's possible it's certainly possible that they're doing something where they're using the type the the tree the AST's representation of types and somehow leveraging that for their type analysis, but that's just totally different than what the Rust compiler itself does. There's things, there's types that the Rust compiler will construct that don't correspond to any um, node in the abstract in the abstract syntax tree, because if you think about it, the type system of Rust ends up acting like a kind of lambda calculus where it's going to end up taking um, effectively type constructors things like vec and apply them to inputs like string and compose those things together and gives you a type that is a thing that um has meaning and if you repeatedly compose those things the, the type vec of string may well occur in your source code but the result of repeated compositions that occurs from monomorphizing stuff won't be in the source code a vec of vec of strings may where will not be in the source code even though it's implicitly there from one generic function being applied to another type that then has to be monomorphized into that specific constructed type that needs to be represented in the rust type system okay um, <laughs> <it's> real, <laughs> sorry real quick before because i know i know you're we're running out of time yeah, today uh, I got stop, I got a hard stop at, at the half hour mark. It's true. What's up? So, uh, no, I was just going to ask: Is there any plan? What's the plans for the next uh, video? Or, or is, that's a good you question. You know what? I, let me let me. I think the right thing for me to do here actually is to maybe make a public kind of statement about this. I'm trying to figure out whether the system is working right. Like I, I actually am trying to figure out whether this is the best way for me to try to drive engagement with people to like learn about the compiler, and whether like these live action uh, cap sessions capturing me looking at some specific problem and usually trying to tailor it around some topic area, but still spending an hour um, or more doing something and then cutting it down to something that is an hour potentially, right? Like these videos are long and that's a big ask for some people to like sit there and watch a video. So I literally was talking to, to Nico recently and we were comparing this experience to other kinds of tutorial experiences where there's other ones that have videos, but they are, um, did I talk, uh, I, yeah, I might've talked about this in the Zulip as well. Um, an alternative approach of saying, look, you don't need to have an hour long video. You can have curated content. That's like a, a kind of set of exercises that are spelling out, like try this, do this, do this. And with a opening video, giving a high level overview of the ideas that are going to be covered in that, in that write up. And we were just debating, like, what is the right model here? What is the best way for people to like, um, get engaged. Obviously, there's advantages of pure text in terms of people who don't have time for videos or don't like them may be able to work well with pure text. But the problem, the whole thing I was trying to attack here was the problem that the Rusty Ted guys already is pure text, and we wanted to figure out other avenues to get people engaged. So, yeah, I think the right answer for me to give you here is the, the next steps are not clear. My current plan is to just pick out a different topic and do another video, maybe next week, maybe a week after. Um, the same way I have been of just doing it on my own and post editing it and posting it up and then we'll have associated office hours. That's my current plan, but I'm super curious to hear from people about whether 
they think a dis that 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 a different model might be work might work better for them. Um, because I don't want to spend the time making this stuff if it's not getting uh, people engaged. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Makes makes sense. Um, I think. I, I mean, I, I'm glad that there's uh, more information than less as far as having more content on on YouTube. I'm a I'm a big consumer on, on YouTube, so um, for me, it's a really good medium. Um, but I think I, I know there's a couple ways to kind of go about um, teaching things, and I guess if the is the point to get people contributing to the compiler to get people to know how the compiler works, I guess, like, which which one you're emphasizing on? I think my primary interest is on, I want the people who are interested in contributing to have an easy on ramp. So I think, like, it's not something where I'm worried about people. Okay, it's not like I'm trying to figure out how to advertise, hey, we want contributors, like, rah, 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 rust, come and contribute to the compiler, we want more contributors, because I think we already have people who come regularly saying, I want to contribute. And the problem is we don't have a good on-ramping experience for those people, apart from join the Zulip, ask questions, be self-motivated, right? We have, mm -hmm. the past model has been relied a lot on people to be self-motivated to put up with a lot of roadblocks along the way and a lot of learning along the way. And we wanted to identify what are the concepts that we need to get across early on to have fewer roadblocks and have people feel like they can productively make progress with things and learn about stuff as they're going and, and but have it be a slow, you know, an easy, easy on wrapping where they can make do they can, they can contribute and learn more and more as they go. Um, that's, think, that's my goal. I think uh, at least for me, it's been the way you've done it so far. Uh, it's made it approachable. Like as far as just getting, my hands like building the rust compiler getting in there doing debug stuff um got a plane coming over um, that's okay i still was able to hear you i think I, I hope you're right and i look if nothing i, I am I, I am happy to see you come back to these sessions because it means that at least my time is not going out to a total void of zero like i, I have at least you to be like okay there's someone giving me active feedback mm -hmm. in particular this session today's session was super good because hearing you ask those questions about what are you talking about with this E1, this E0 type stuff? Made me realize I've really got to spell out what I'm talking about here in terms of the structure, how, it, how this tree is being represented in this funny way that is potentially unusual for people. People who come from Lisp or even Java, people who come from garbage listed languages often have trees that where the, the data is directly um, embedded as a tree structure in the actual type system with a recursive type. Um, and this structure where it's not a recursive type is potentially new to a lot of people. And I hadn't even really thought about that um, being a potential area that needs to be um, at least, uh, what's the word, explored, you know. I think that that's that would be maybe good for the, I know there's the Rusty contributors like divided into three levels. Uh, yeah. I think that would be really good for the second level. But I think um, uh, if I was to cast my, my boat into the hat for maybe what your next uh, video might be. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really interested in the uh, the testing that you mentioned before. Um, how how should I go about thinking about adding tests? Should I take the uh, examples given from the GitHub issue and turn that into a test? Add that to the test? Um, any sorts of uh, not? Um, no, that'd be great. I have I have a lot of thoughts here, and I know I have I have issues that I, like I literally file that's like. Or there are definitely to-dos I made for myself saying, oh, this needs to be this 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 test needs to be minimized and we need to make a test for it. I think there's lots of meat for me to pull off there to make an, a session about that. So I can I can make that the next session. I think that'd be a good a good task. Um and you're right, it's it's an excellent onboarding thing because it's the kind of thing where you don't need to know much about the compiler internals to make progress there. You just need to know how to build the compiler and think about the code. Um and this and this stuff about also the fact that you are working on a minimizer tool and we have um, Neil Strid working on, I'm sure that I didn't pronounce their name correctly, but that their username correctly, but there's that other tool. There's, there's, I'm excited. I'm ex I personally excited by the fact that there's people investing time on the minim automatic minimization work, because I think if we can make any progress there, it'll be hugely helpful um, in a lot of problems that we face. So that's good too. Yeah. Okay. But thank you for that feedback. I will, I will take that into consideration. I will take that heavily into consideration about, what to do for my next session. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much time. for joining. It's been great.
no, it's, it's awesome. I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, I, I'm getting out of it, uh, a lot out of it and I'm sure other people are too. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Nice talking to you. Okay. See you. All right. Bye.